diabetes and CLD, the interrelationship. So if the diabetes is superimposed in the normal, in person with normal liver function, still it increases the risk of NAFLD by two to five fold. And also increases the risk of HCV infection by 3.5 fold. That is the effect of diabetes. And diabetes, if it is superimposed on chronic liver disease patients, it causes faster progression of the fibrosis in alcoholic liver disease, NAFLD and chronic HCV infection. And also increase the risk of cirrhosis, chronic HBV and chronic HCV and overall and liver related mortality also increases. And diabetes, if it is superimposed on MC liver disease, it decreases the overall survival by 40% in five years. And also increase the risk of ascites, renal dysfunction, bilateral, the bacterial infections, hepatic encephalopathy. And lastly, diabetes superimposed on the liver transplantation. The, it increases the post-transplant mortality, post-operative complications, and acute rejection. And also increase the risk of post-transplant metabolic syndrome, and recurrent reonset the NAFLD after the transplantation. So diabetes has effect at every level in the liver disease. So the take home message I would like to pass it on to you today is this elevation of serum ALT while uncommon in apparently normal subjects, it is common in patients with type two diabetes. The most common cause of a mild elevation of serum ALT is NAFLD, which is the most prevalent liver disease in type two diabetes. And type 2 diabetes constitutes one of the high risk population for screening for advanced fibrosis. And FIB4 index and enhanced liver fibrosis tests are important biochemical parameters used in risk stratification and follow up of these patients. And diabetes that develops as a consequence of liver cirrhosis is called as heterogeneous diabetes, which is distinct from type 2 diabetes. And heterogeneous diabetes is characterized by normal fasting glucose, HbA1c, and elevated postprandial glucose with less risk of development of micro and microvascular complications. And the traditional fasting glucose and A1C thresholds used for diagnosis of type 2 diabetes underestimate the prevalence of diabetes in patient with chronic liver disease. And OGTT is recommended for screening for cirrhotic patients for diabetes. So I conclude my session. Thank you very much for patient listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for your detailed presentation. Any questions from audience? My question to you is, uh, uh, could you comment on uh, digital therapeutic uh, apps like uh, Freedom from Diabetes and Fit of Fly in uh, remitting diabetes in these CLD patients? We don't have experience of using those uh, apps uh, as of now, but I think they are emerging uh, in uh, the increasing technology. So they will be having, having good place in uh, causing diabetes remission, but I don't have personal experience of using these apps. Probably, sir, will add something. Pointing to us. So actually, my uh, father-in-law is uh, NASH CLD mm -hmm. with diabetes uh, for 20 years. And uh, he's been on the regular oral hypoglycemics. And recently, they have joined uh, uh, this uh, app called Freedom from Diabetes. And they were very elated to have reversed diabetes in one week. And uh, uh, it's an app which gives personalized uh, treatment and suggestions to patients on a daily basis. And e the patient is uh, assigned one doctor each from an endocrinologist, a hepatologist, and so on. It's a personalized uh, care which is given to the patient and so my uh, view my question was uh, is it really possible to reverse diabetes like that so i think the answer to your question is no so if your father has been or father-in-law has been a stable diabetic of 20 years with nash whatever level of fibrosis then obviously i don't think the doctor the endocrinologist or hepatologist would have done much because he's already a stable uh, gentleman 
So I think the most important messages which are very, very important from laboratory medicine point of view from SARS talk is that there is no good parameter to diagnose diabetes in a patient with chronic liver disease. All right, so that is the message that you should carry home. So do not get carried away by somebody having an A1C of five and thinking that this patient does not have poor glycemia. And also similarly, do not get carried away by a value of sugar that you see. So you know, cirrhosis is a very funny condition. So obviously the last few s slides from Dr. Ramana's talk were worth their weight in gold, which is what he mentioned about what happens in cirrhosis. So everything turns on its head. Traditional diabetes is that it's a state in which you are insulinopenic. This is a condition in which you are not insulinopenic, you are hyperinsulinopenic. So you might argue that type 2 diabetics are also the same, isn't it? That will be the endocrinologist's perspective. But how is liver disease different? Liver disease is different because this is also a state where you are hyperglucagonomic, all right? But there isn't anything much to mobilize from the liver. And that is why you always err on the side of treating these patients only when there is a real need to. So even that 107 value which Sir said, you have to be extremely careful when you are treating these patients because as the cirrhosis advances, you have less stores of glycogen. So you are more likely to develop hypoglycemia rather than develop a hyperglycemia uh, and its consequences. Anybody who's got a background history of diabetes, you must always keep looking at them from their end organ damage perspective. So whatever things that he told you, they are also very relevant from what happens to the renal function, what happens to the microvasculature, what happens to the retinopathy and the like. The distinction between hepatogenous diabetes and the standard diabetes with cirrhosis to my mind is odious. Okay, it is not very relevant because you are talking of those things which have so obviously, how will you have end organ damage if you develop diabetes for a short duration? So even a typical diabetic doesn't develop those things. So important message is threshold of di diagnosing diabetes in a cirrhotic is very different from general population. A1C does not mean much. You can bleed, you can have nutritional anemia, you can have hyperspinism, you will have falsely low values. Similarly, when you have someone who's got high glucose values, do not be in a rush to treat these patients especially if this patient is decompensated. So sir mentioned about the OGTT, but what will happen to OGTT if you have got a lot of collaterals? Do you think about it? So if you are giving an oral glucose test and you have got a portosystemic collaterals, what will happen to your glucose values? Okay, so the first pass is gone. So you will again get false values of the serum glucose. So no one value in a cirrhotic will be able to tell you that this person has diabetes. However, if you are consistently getting values say in excess of 200. So for our unit, the threshold in a decompensated serotic transplant unit is we'll get alarmed only if the values are more than 200. We don't treat them, all right? And after that, of course, in decompensation, it's only cirrhosis. Far more nuanced is what happens when your bilirubin values are between one to three and you are compensated. But of course, this is for the clinicians. So what agents to use? We don't use sulfonylureas. Especially in the NASH population, we don't use sulfonylureas. We use only those drugs which are weight neutral. Mm -hmm. So sir mentioned about the GLP-1 agonist. Those drugs are still not very easily available to our population because of the expense, but they would become the order of the day. Metformin is the only drug which has been shown to improve transplant-free survival in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So this is a retrospective study from Indiana University where it was shown that even if you do not have diabetes, but if you are using metformin in patients who've got decompensated cirrhosis, albeit in the proper dose, then you can improve the transplant-free survival. So management is nuanced, diagnosis is difficult, keep the threshold of treatment extremely high, end organ damage must be looked at. It has got serious implications when you transplant these patients, especially for post-transplant infections. Now only one caveat to whatever has been said or discussed so far. If you have got a cirrhotic patient who continues to develop frequent infections, whether it is skin soft tissue infection or urosepsis, then you would want to treat them at lower thresholds also, if you have been having a history of diabetes. Okay, so that is the only exception to what I said. So I told that if you have got values in excess of 200, then only you want to treat these patients because you don't want them to develop hypoglycemia. Nocturnal hypoglycemia, extremely common in cirrhotic, so they become catabolic, so that is why you as, as, as people on the laboratory medicine or those of you who are on the clinical side, we always ask them to take seven to eight meals a day. So there should be a supper, 
and this will be followed by because cirrhotic patients when they lie down they pass more urine every time a patient gets up in the night you give him something to eat so between his dinner early dinner supper and between supper and the time he wakes up you should give him at least two more snacks okay so that because they do not have any glycogen stores to mobilize so these are the important things from the laboratory perspective so a1c which is what we all swear by not useful fasting sugar values not useful OGTT, especially if you have got a lot of collaterals, again has its own drawbacks. So it has to be a clinical approach to managing diabetes and its assessment in this cohort of patients. Yeah. Sir, would you like yes, to sir. say something? Yeah, I have one comment, sir, about the reverse of diabetes, as you mentioned. As sir, I mentioned there's no reversal, but there's remission of diabetes, which is described, where this organization also have described. So remission means the patient who has already diagnosed a diabetic, but who is able to control without requiring drug with lifestyle modification if the patient is able to maintain the blood sugars in the normal range with HbA1c less than 6.5% for continuously three to six months, at least three months. Then that is called remission of diabetes. It is not reversal. So it is possible only in the early stage of diabetes, not in the long standing case. Patient will develop comorbid conditions, complications. In that stage, it is not possible, obviously. But in early stage of diabetes who are recently detected to diabetic, so they, they can go into remission temporarily by following the lifestyle modification without requiring drugs for a few months. So if they are very compliant, maybe for one or two years also, they will be able to manage. Uh, that is called remission of diabetes. But ultimately, in the long run, they also may go into diabetes later. So it is called remission, not reversal. So obviously, there is no reversal of diabetes. In diabetes, once it gets diagnosed, you know that 50% of the beta cell mass has gone. So the remaining 50% will gradually come down, gradually as the duration of diabetes increases. So there is no reversal, but remission is possible with uh, strict diet and exercise, lifestyle modification. So that's what uh, we know, but uh, there is no reversal. Thank you, sir. Two, two situations in which the patient comes to you and tells you that he had a bad glycemic status and now that has gotten better without medication. So one is liver disease and one is chronic kidney disease. All right, so these are the two situations that you should always remember. So in both these two scenarios, you will have a patient come up to you and say that I am long-standing diabetic, but now I do not need any medication and my sugars are well controlled. Incidence of diabetes is high. So it's a real, it's a just by chance or it's a real culprit. The cryptogenic is a mixed bag. So cryptogenic means you could not find an etiology. So sir mentioned from that AIM study, 56% was in the nafeld nash syndrome and 50% was in cryptogenic. So what does that tell you? So that tells you that most of the cryptogenics were also actually NASH. NASH is a very funny thing. It's diagnosed on the basis of fat infiltration in the liver, but as the fibrosis progresses, the fat quantum in the liver keeps coming down. So when Dr. Milap is doing the explant pathology, even in patients who've got established NASH cirrhosis, you will see only about fat in five to 10% of hepatic hepatocytes. So as fibrosis advances, the fat keeps coming down. So there is a thought that most of the cryptogenic cirrhotics are actually nafeld NASH and a very, very small proportion burnt out autoimmunes. So these are the two uh, etiologies of liver disease which constitute this basket of cryptogenic. This number is dwindling, the cryptogenic numbers in most databases is dwindling because we have got very good tools to diagnose the etiology. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now welcome Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, sir, to give us information on clinical interpretation of liver function tests. All right, so I will take some liberties. Sir. I'll request my colleague, Dr. Ajay, to make this presentation, and then I will try to check how, how awake this audience is after his talk.
now I'll be briefly discussing about the clinical interpretation of liver function test in clinical scenarios. So uh, there are a lot of case scenarios. Uh, I think I'll better first discuss and later on we'll uh, have some discussion on these case scenarios. So liver has multiple functions including uh, metabolism of protein, fat, and uh, glucose me uh, metabolism. Along with that, it has coagulative functions, uh, excretion and metabolism of various genobiotic substances. It plays an important role in immune functions and also has an important role in regeneration of the diseased liver. Traditionally described classic liver tests, they include serum enzyme activities in the form of aminotransferases, ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, concentration of total bilirubin and al total proteins and albumin. Blood tests that are commonly used to assess the synthetic function of the liver, they include serum albumin and prothrombin time. Abnormal liver function tests, uh, they are reported around in 1 to 4 percent of the asymptomatic population. The significance of any liver blood test uh, abnormality, it must be interpreted in the setting of the clinical situation and an initial evaluation of the patient with abnormal liver function test should take into account the patient's symptoms, risk factors, medication history, past and uh, current medical history, and physical examination findings. The commonly used liver function test, total bilirubin uh, and uh, direct bilirubin, it helps in assessment of the uh, conjugatory and excretory function of the liver. Aminotransferases, their values are increased whenever there is injury to the liver or uh, death of the hepatocyte. Alkaline phosphatase and uh, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, these are cholestatic enzymes. They are released in circulation whenever there is any biliary injury or biliary obstruction. Albumin and prothrombin time, they uh, help in assessment of the synthetic function of the liver. So bilirubin uh, is produced by breakdown of the red blood hemoglobin uh, and bilirubin, it is uh, along with albumin carried to the liver, that is unconjugated bilirubin. In the liver, it undergoes conjugation, and the conjugated bilirubin is secreted in, into the bile through the canal coli. Uh, this uh, uh, bile then is secreted into the intestine. So the, uh, these uh, enzymes, they have a specific location in the hepatocytes. The aminotransferases, uh, ALT is uh, specifically located in the cytoplasm. Uh, whereas AS, about 80% of the AST is located in the cytoplasm and 20% in the mitochondria. Alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, they are located in the canal coli and LDH is located in the mitochondria. So uh, aminotransferases, uh, the ALT is uh, an organ localization is liver and kidney. For AST, it is situated in, the, it can be found in liver, heart, muscle and red blood cells. ALT is more specific for liver diseases, whereas AST is less specific. ALT is located in the uh, uh, cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. AST more in the mitochondria, about 80%, and uh, in cytoplasm, it was about 20%. Half-life of ALT is 48 hours, and that of AST is approximately 18 hours. So several factors can influence the level of these enzymes. Some of these factors, they include age, gender of the patient, nutritional status, food intake, exercise, and uh, delay in sampling processing. Normally, ALT is more than AST, with ALT-AST ratio more than one. ALT uh, is present in cytoplasm, and it is released with minor hepatocellular injury also. AST is uh, present more in mitochondria, and it is released when, whenever there is severe injury. Uh, however, in some uh, diseases, AST levels tend to be higher, and the AST-ALT ratio uh, can be altered, uh, as seen in alcoholic liver disease, Wilson's disease, liver cirrhosis, non-hepatic causes such as uh, hemolytic anemia, muscle disease, hectic exercise, and heart disease. Now coming to uh, cholestatic enzymes, alkaline phosphatase and uh, gl uh, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. Common causes of raised ALP and GGT, they include extrahepatic biliary obstruction, primary biliary cholangitis, Pri primary sclerosing cholangitis, infiltrative diseases, IgG4 associated cholangitis, malignancy, which may be either primary or metastatic. Drug induced causes of raised ALP and GGT include uh, anabolic steroids, carbamazepine, phenytoin, barbiturates, and many uh, herbal medications. 
ALP levels can be low in patients with cirrhosis due, uh, due to Wilson's disease and also along with uh, protein, magnesium and zinc deficiency. Serum albumin, uh, albumin is synthesized in the liver. Its half-life is around uh, 20 to 21 days. Uh, liver disease leads to reduced production of albumin. Short duration liver disease, usually albumin levels are not affected. However, if the liver disease of longer duration, uh, albumin levels will be reduced. Other causes of reduced serum albumin level, they include protein, malnutrition, and loss of albumin due to various kidney diseases and uh, also along with chronic diarrhea. Prothrombin time, it is a laboratory test that measures some aspect of the blood coagulation, usually factor 2, 5, 7, and 10. Uh, prolonged value of prothrombin time indicates reduced liver function. It is a specific marker of liver failure. It has been uh, useful for used for monitoring of the degree of liver dysfunction. So these, uh, these are the commonly used uh, liver function tests in day-to-day -day practice. And uh, they uh, are uh, incorporated in various uh, multiple scores which are used to define the liver diseases, uh, such as uh, this King's College criteria for uh, prognosticating acute liver failure. Uh, due to paracetamol, mm, the criteria include uh, arterial pH less than 7.3 after fluid resuscitation, or all of the following, including PTA prothrombin time more than 100 seconds, uh, serum creatinine more than 3.4 mg per deciliter, and grade 3 or grade 4 hepatic encephalopathy. <laughs> In non-acetaminophen uh, induced ALF, the prothrombin time more than 100 uh, seconds is itself uh, uh, sufficient to diagnose acute liver failure or any three of the following, including uh, etiology of non-A, non-B viral hepatitis, drug-induced or indeterminate etiology of uh, acute liver failure. Time from jaundice to encephalopathy more than seven days, age less than 10 years or more than 40 years, prothrombin time more than 50 seconds, and serum bilirubin more than 17.4 milligram per deciliter. Uh, commonly used scores for prognosticating chronic liver disease, they include child uh, score and uh, male score. In male score, uh, we use uh, bilirubin, INR, and creatinine. And the components of the child book score, they include serum, albumin, bilirubin, prothrombin time, INR, and clinical components of ascites and encephalopathy. Child A, five to six points is child A, 7 to 9 is child B, and uh, uh, 10 to 15 is child C. Now, approach to patient with uh, raised bilirubin. So, whenever patient comes with uh, clinical history suggestive of alleged discolation of eyes and urine, uh, first uh, and most important thing is proper history assessment, along with focus on medication and drug exposure followed by physical examination. Lab tests include bilirubin with fractionation, uh, enzyme assessment in the form of ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, prothrombin time, and uh, albumin assessment. If there is isolated bilirubin elevation, we have to fractionate it whether it is direct or indirect. Direct hyperbilirubinemia is when uh, direct bilirubin is more than 15%, uh, and uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia is uh, diagnosed when direct bilirubin is less than 15%. So common causes of indirect hyperbilirubinemia, they include hemolytic disorders, ineffective erythropoiesis, inherited disorders such as Gilbert syndrome, regular Najjar syndrome, and drug-induced causes uh, such as rifampicin, provenicid. Common causes of isolated direct hyperbilirubinemia, they are uh, inherited disorders drug, such as Dubin-Johnson syndrome and Rota syndrome. Uh, if there is, uh, along with the elevation of the bilirubin, uh, elevation in the liver enzymes, uh, so we have to categorize it in uh, pattern as uh, hepatocellular cholestatic. Whenever uh, ALT, AST levels are elevated out of proportion to uh, cholestatic enzymes, that is alkaline phosphatase, uh, then we have to evaluate for viral serologies such as hepatitis A, uh, IgM antibody, hepatitis B surface antigen, and uh, HCV RNA should be assessed. Along with this, toxicology screening uh, should also be done. If the results, results are negative, further additional testing should be done for assessment of uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, if indicated hepatitis D virus, and hepatitis E IgM. If the results are positive, we'll get the diagnosis. If the results are still negative, based on the clinical situation of the patient, uh, we may need to go for liver biopsy.
uh, if there is uh, increase in the cholestatic pattern, uh, alkaline phosphate is out of proportion to ALT and AST, then uh, first uh, further uh, investigation should be uh, ultrasound. Mm -hmm. On ultrasound, if there are uh, dilated ducts, uh, then it indicates of uh, extrahepatic cholestasis. Uh, should further go for uh, CT or uh, MRCP evaluation. And if the ducts are not dilated, uh, then uh, it indicates uh, intrahepatic cholestasis. In case of intrahepatic cholestasis, should further evaluate for the serologic testing, including uh, hepatitis serologies, hepatitis A, CME, EBV, and uh, antimitocondrial antibody. Also, a thorough drug uh, history should be uh, reviewed. If the AM is positive and clinical picture is suggestive, then one should go for liver biopsy. And if the uh, results are negative, the further evaluation should be either MRCP or uh, liver biopsy based on the clinical profile of the patient. So, um, so uh, how to categorize the, uh, this hepatocellular and cholestatic? It is based on R ratio. Uh, if R is calculated as ALT by ALT of upper uh, lo limit of normal divided by alkaline phosphatase of value of the patient upon uh, upper limit of the alkaline phosphatase. If this R ratio is more than 5, it is categorized as hepatocellular pattern. If the ratio is less than 2, it is categorized as cholestatic pattern. And if the ratio is between 2 to 5, it is categorized as mixed pattern. So common conditions with uh, abnormal liver biochemical tests, these uh, there are multiple conditions which can have abnormality in liver, bi uh, liver biochemistry. Uh, most commonly we uh, see, see in our clinical practice, they are related to alcoholic hepatitis, viral hepatitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, then uh, uncommon conditions such as hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, celiac disease, and uh, autoimmune hepatitis and drug-induced liver injury, they are also very common in the clinical practice. Now, the uh, abnormal liver function test are also we can find in uh, pregnancy also. So pregnancy has its own pregnancy uh, related liver diseases and uh, in uh, during ANC time, uh, patients can have uh, abnormal liver function test and jaundice due to other systemic causes also. So disorders specific to pregnancy, they include uh, hyperemesis, gravidarum, uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, uh, HELP syndrome and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Mm, the pre onset of uh, uh, during pregnancy usually hyperemesis gravidarum is seen in first trimester, whereas uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is seen in third trimester. HELP syndrome and AFL, uh, uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy they also are seen in third trimester of the pregnancy. Clinical picture in uh, hyperemesis gravidarum usually patient presents with intense nausea and vomiting along with dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities. There can be elevation in the amino transferases. However, it is less than 300 units per liter. A patient can have elevated bilirubin, but it is usually less than 4 mg per deciliter. Imaging is usually normal. Histology is most of the times not required. And uh, perinatal outcome, uh, most of the times, uh, they can have preterm delivery along with low birth weight. In intrahepatic cholestasis, the, the clinical picture is characterized by generalized pruritus, elevated serum bile acid levels, and uh, there can be uh, elevation in the amino transferases, maximum up to 20-fold also seen. Bilirubin is usually less than 5 mg per deciliter. Imaging is normal. Histology, if at all needed, is suggestive of cholesterol picture. Perinatal outcome, um, most of the times low birth weight baby and uh, meconium staining can be there. HELP syndrome, clinical picture, uh, most of the times uh, HELP syndrome patients have associated preeclampsia and uh, hypertension. Uh, there can be uh, evidence of hemolysis and thrombocytopenia. Amino transferases are usually more than 500 uh, units per liter. Bilirubin is less than 5 mg per deciliter. Imaging may show hepat hepatic infarction. Histology, if done, it is suggestive of patchy or extensive necrosis and hemorrhage. Uh, most of the time, there is perinatal mortality and uh, premature delivery. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy is associated with preeclampsia in more than 50% of the cases. Uh, presentation is with liver failure along with coagulopathy, encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, and DIC. <laughs> Amino transferases usually are more than 300 to 500 uh, units per liter with bilirubin up to 5 mg per deciliter. Imaging may uh, be suggestive of fatty infiltration and histology is suggestive of microvesicular steatosis in zone 3. Fetal mortality is usually 10 to 20 percent. 
Now, whatever this traditional uh, liver function test we have uh, discussed uh, uh, recently, they are, uh, have limited value in assessment of the metabolic function of the liver. Now, there are multiple tests which can help in assessment of the metabolic function of the liver. These tests are called quantitative liver function tests. Now, these tests involve the administration of a certain uh, drug and the subs subsequent measurement of its uh, substrate is done. These tests include hepatic blood tests, clearance test and assessment of portal systemic shunt and severity of liver disease uh, which is done by using dual collate test. So there are various hepatic breath tests available. Uh, commonly used are uh, aminopyrin breath test, methacetin breath test and limax test. In aminopyrin and methacetin test they are uh, uh, given by oral route and uh, limax test is by done by intravenous route. Uh, in aminopyrin breath test, uh, 13 carbon labeled aminopyrin is uh, dissolved in uh, warm water about 75 milligram and the breath assessment is done every 10 minutes for 2 hours. It helps in assessment of the cytochrome uh, P450 and monoxygenases. Uh, usually these tests are not easily available and uh, there can be genetic variations in cytochrome P450 uh, enzymes and these tests are less useful in case of biliary obstruction. Methacetin bread test is similar. Uh, it helps in uh, assessment of cytochrome enzymes uh, and the, its results depend on hepatic blood flow and rate is affected by the genetic variation. In Limax test, intravenous 2 mg uh, per kg, uh, 13 carbon label methacetin is given and breath samples are collected at baseline 10 minutes prior to injection and 60 minutes after injection. Uh, they help in assessment of these cytochrome enzymes and they are less dependent on the oral uh, absorption of the drug. The other tests, uh, uh, they are clearance tests which are commonly used is indocyanine green test. Uh, other tests include antipyrin test and sulfobromophthalein test. Uh, most commonly used test uh, is uh, in clinical practice is indocyanine green test. In this 0.5 milligram per kilogram of ICG is given intravenously and venous samples are assessed every 5 minutes for uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Indocyanine and green plasma disappearance rate more than 15% per minute uh, should be there. Uh, this helps in assessment of the hepatocyte mass and uh, excretory function of the liver. The test uh, results may be affected by portal vein thrombosis, excessive bilirubin level, portosystemic shunting and systemic inflammatory response syndrome. In uh, antipyrin test, uh, 15 mg per kg of antipyrin is uh, given and uh, 1 ml saliva uh, is collected after 4 and 24 hours. This help in assessment of the microsomal oxidases. Uh, it has uh, multiple drug interactions and the test cannot be repeated within one week. The other test is uh, sulfobromothalin test. 5 mg of uh, sulfobromothalin is given per kg body weight and venous sampling is done at 30 minutes and 45 minutes. More than 5% retention is uh, told as abnormal. It also helps in hepatic ma hepatocyte mass assessment and excretory function of the liver. Uh, for assessment of the portal systemic shunting and uh, severity of liver disease, uh, test used is a dual collate test. Uh, this collate is an endogenous bile salt and it is synthesized in the liver from cholesterol. Its uh, approximate pool is 1 to 3 gram and it is maintained by hepatic and intestinal transporters. It has high first pass hepatic extraction that is 80 to 90 percent. In the dual collate test, uh, uh, collate is administered in two forms. One is oral form which is D4 collate and the uh, other is IV form which is 13C collate. Now they are administered simultaneously and the ratio of uh, these IV and oral collate clearance is, uh, it helps in estimation of the portal systemic shunt. This test uh, quantifies three parameters of liver function that is uh, clearance from the systemic circulation, clearance from the portal circulation and portal systemic shunting. Uh, based on this dual collate test, a disease severity index can be assessed. It has been produced using outputs of portal systemic shunt, portal filtration rate and systemic filtration rate. It is related to liver biopsy fibrosis stage and it, uh, it is able to predict clinical outcome also. A disease severity index of more than 19 predicts cirrhosis and risk of future complications from end stage liver disease. So now we will have some brief cases and uh, we will try to analyze these uh, based on the clinical history and uh, the uh, available liver function test. 
Here is a 26 years male patient who has a alcohol use disorder. He presented with a history of analexia, fatigability, yellowish discoloration of eyes for around eight weeks. On physical examination, his weight is 48 kg, tachycardia, uh, 102 per minute. Blood pressure is 116 by 72 millimeter of mercury. He is clinically ectalic, edema is present. Uh, on physical examination, liver is palpable, 4 cm below right coastal margin. Spleen is palpable and uh, there is no free fluid. On presentation, uh, his, bilirubin, his bilirubin was 45.3 with a direct component of 21.3. SGOT was 209, SGPT 27, alkaline phosphate is, and GGT, they are, uh, alkaline phosphate is 73, GGT 39. Albumin is 3.7, globulin 2.7. INR was 3.17, uh, serum creatinine was 3.4 milligram per deciliter. He was hospitalized. Subsequently, his uh, uh, liver function test uh, showed Minimal changes, uh, however, there was significant improvement his, in his renal function, however, coagulopathy persisted. So, uh, on day 9, uh, there was significant improvement in his renal function, and uh, however, uh, uh, his bilirubin remained same, SGOT around 200, SGPT 25, albumin 3.7, globulin 2.5. So, this patient uh, he's, uh, typically he has alcohol use disorder, short duration of history. Clinically, he has uh, uh, features of SARS, and he's uh, based on this evaluation, the uh, diagnosis of this uh, clinical diagnosis of this patient will be alcoholic hepatitis. Now, the second case uh, here is 46 years male patient had no addictions, there is easy fatigability, yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine for five months. On physical examination, his weight is 62 kg, pallor is present, icterus and edema is present, hepatosplenomegaly is present, and the shifting dullness is present. Uh, on uh, evaluation, his bilirubin is 8.1 milligram with uh, direct bilirubin of 2.5, SGOT 85, SGPT 31, alkaline phosphate is 112, GGT 16, total protein of 5.7 with albumin 2.8 and globulin of 3.1. Uh, subsequent uh, LFT was also similar. So in this, uh, there is uh, amino transferases. They are uh, elevated, but not more than two, uh, two to three times of the upper limit of the normal. There is reversal in the albumin uh, globulin ratio. Globulin is more than albumin. So uh, this patient uh, clinically, he has features of decompensation along with this uh, derange uh, LFT and coagulopathy. So clinical diagnosis in this patient will be chronic liver disease uh, along with decompensation. Now the third case, uh, here is 41 years old female patient who presented with easy fatigability, decreased appetite and jaundice for three months. There is history of uh, small joint pain in upper limb, history of uh, uh, consumption of alternative medicine, for two months uh, for joint pain and jaundice. Uh, she had past history of jaundice uh, three times, uh, one in four years ago, second 15 years ago, and 18 years ago. She also has uh, hypothyroidism and she is on treatment. She uh, presented uh, her LFT was suggestive of uh, bilirubin 7.8 milligram per deciliter, direct component of 4.6, SGOT 86, SGPT 67, alkaline phosphate is 134, GGT 89, Albumin is 3.6, globulin is 1.7, INR 1.6. On day 10, the labs were more or less similar with slight uh, reduction in the bilirubin. So this patient uh, had uh, short duration history presented uh, along with uh, history of polyarthralgia and uh, autoimmune uh, phenomenon in the form of hypothyroid disorder. And in the LFT, there is uh, increased globulin levels and uh, transaminitis along with the elevated bilirubin. So we should further evaluate this patient for evidence of any autoimmunity. Now next case, uh, here is 29 years old female patient presented with easy fatigability, decreased appetite, jaundice for 20 days. There is history of uh, complementary and alternative medicines, uh, history of altered sensorium for uh, three days. 
physical examination suggestive of tachycardia pulse rate was 108 per minute blood pressure 110 by 60 mm of mercury clinically she has pallor ectalysis present on abdominal examination it is soft no non tender there is no organomegaly no free fluid on uh, neurological examination flaps are present her uh, uh, blood test were suggestive of uh, uh, elevated inr uh, 3.42 uh, total bilirubin of 19.4 mg per deciliter direct component of 8.3 sgpt 190 sgot 129 alkaline phosphate is 156 albumin 3.9 globulin 2.8 uh, serum ammonia is 64 lactate level salt 2.9 subsequent test uh, show the, uh, there was uh, worsening in the coagulopathy uh, and lft was more or less same with lactate levels holding around 2.4 on day 4 uh, she remained the same uh, with uh, bilirubin of 20 and uh, serum lactate was 10.1 inr was 3.6 so this patient presented with short duration of uh, history of uh, jaundice along with that uh, history of encephalopathy uh, jaundice and encephalopathy duration is more than 7 days in this case she has uh, coagulopathy uh, and bilirubin she also has bilirubin more than 17 so this short duration this uh, clinical diagnosis fits in the uh, acute liver failure now this is a brief case uh, uh, 38 years female presented with right upper quadrant pain for 7 days there is history of uh, yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine uh, and, and physical examination showed uh, clinically ectalysis present right upper quadrant tenderness there is no organomegaly the bilirubin was 5.2 mg per deciliter with direct component of 3.8 sgot 56 sgpt is 102 alkaline phosphate is 456 ggt is 200 total protein is 6.1 albumin is 3.6 globulin is 3.5 so this patient presents with uh, history of uh, tip, uh, right upper quadrant pain and along with that there is jaundice and elevation in the cholestatic enzymes so uh, this is suggestive of extra hepatic bil uh, biliary obstruction more likely due to the uh, cholelithiasis col 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 or cholelithiasis now next case is uh, 48 years female for sorry 48 years male patient with 7 uh, year history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and 6 years history of hypertension weight is 88 kg height is 160 cm and uh, gives history of easy fatigability uh, bilirubin level of 2.1 mg per deciliter with direct component of 0.8 sgot 86 sgpt 76 alkaline phosphate is 134 ggt 89 total protein of 6.1 albumin 3.6 globulin 2.5 so here is uh, uh, patient is ha having obesity uh, his bmi is uh, more than around 25 and presents with uh, slightly elevated bilirubin levels along with transaminitis uh, up to two uh, times upper limit elevated normal uh, sgpt and sgot so in this case uh, we should further evaluate for the assessment of the non alcoholic fatty liver and there is no history of any alcohol consumption or viral screening is also negative so should further evaluate for non alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, nash in this patient now there is 18 year patient uh, in first pregnancy 35 weeks gestation presented with nausea vomiting and jaundice there is no travel history on physical examination there is clinically ectalysis present systemic examination revealed no significant abnormality there was uh, she had spontaneous delivery apgar score of 9 by 10 and birth weight of 2.2 kg uh, subsequent to delivery there is uh, his recurrent uh, hypoglycemia history her uh, blood test showed uh, hemoglobin of 11.1 wbc of 26000 platelet 1.89 total bilirubin of 5.8 direct bilirubin of 4.2 sgpt 48 sgot 39 alkaline phosphate is of 331 ggt of 228 total protein 6.7 albumin 3.1 urea 14 creatinine of 1.4 sodium 134 and potassium 3.4.3 uh, day 4 of post delivery revealed uh, there is elevation in her wbc count and uh, uh, also there was increase in her serum bilirubin levels so in this case we should uh, uh, what are the differential diagnosis so uh, most common differential diagnosis in this case should be 
acute fighting level of pregnancy or help syndrome. So uh, based on the clinical picture, uh, in the platelet, there was no significant uh, reduction in the platelet count. So the clinical diagnosis first is acute fatty level of pregnancy. Now coming to the post liver transplant graft function monitoring. Although hepatic graft function can be assessed by dynamic investigations, uh, such as endocyanin and green clearance, uh, lidocaine metabolism or LIMAX test, these tests are not widely available. Liver biochemistry abnormalities are still the mainstay investigation used for monitoring uh, dysfunction after post-transplant setting. So uh, what are the causes of uh, post-liver transplant allograft dysfunction? They are usually based on the timing after transplant. In the first week of the transplant, the differential diagnosis for Allograft dysfunction, they include primary non-function, ischemia, reperfusion, injury, hepatic artery thrombosis, acute cellular rejection, and biliary tract abnormalities. Uh, between one to four weeks, the usual differential diagnosis for uh, graft dysfunction are hepatic artery thrombosis, acute cellular rejection, biliary tract abnormalities, and recurrent viral hepatitis. Between one to three months, the differential diagnosis, they include hepatic artery thrombosis, ductopenic rejection, acute cellular rejection, biliary tract abnormalities, CME hepatitis, recurrence of non-viral disease. And beyond three months, the differential diagnosis, uh, they include all of them along with uh, PTLD, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. Post-transplant, uh, post-liver transplant cholestasis, it, uh, it occurs uh, commonly after liver transplant and is due to impairment in the production of bile in the graft liver or uh, abnormality in the bile flow. Uh, blood tests usually show variable elevations in serum bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and uh, gamma glutamate transpeptidase mm, along with transaminases. Uh, they can be normal or elevated. Common causes of uh, post-liver transplant cholestasis, they are divided into intrahepatic cholestasis and extrahepatic cholestasis. So uh, intrahepatic cholestasis is usually due to primary graft non-function, ischemia reperfusion injury, infections and sepsis, small for size graft, drug toxicity and acute cellular rejection. Extrahepatic cholestasis causes, they are usually due to biliary stricture, biliary leak, cholecholithiasis, biliary cast formation and cholangitis. So we'll uh, briefly discuss two post-transplant cases uh, along with the liver biochemistry. He is a 45 years male patient who underwent uh, DDL10 uh, past. His uh, graft weight was 1500 gram and uh, uh, GRWR was more than one. Donor and recipient uh, anti-PHB core were non-reactive. So after uh, post, uh, in during post-transplant period, uh, initially there was uh, abnormality in liver function test. Total bilirubin was 8.3 with direct of uh, 5.6. SGPT of 1470 and OT was 7045. Uh, he had mild renal dysfunction. Subsequently, uh, there is gradual decline in his uh, uh, amino transferases and uh, his bile also uh, decreased. On POD6, the values were uh, uh, total bilirubin of 5.1 with direct component of 3.3. SGPT was uh, 497 and SGOT was 232. Uh, there was a slight elevation in the cholestatic enzymes, uh, uh, alkaline phosphate is 589 with GGT of uh, 1480. <laughs> so from this, there is subsequent uh, elevation in the cholestatic enzymes and also bilirubin went up. On POD20, uh, the bilirubin is 7.2, SGPT is uh, uh, 260, SGOT is uh, 308. Alkaline phosphatase was 1970 with a GGT of uh, 2105. And uh, on POD20, uh, he underwent a liver biopsy. So at this, uh, what are the differential diagnosis in this patient? So most uh, commonly, uh, this patient uh, has persistent cholestasis along with transaminitis. And uh, so his liver biopsy was suggestive of acute cellular rejection and uh, subsequently he was given uh, solumetal pulse therapy. Now uh, coming to summary, so the traditionally described liver function test, they help in formulating various differential diagnoses in day-to-day -day clinical practice. 
significance of any liver blood test abnormality must be interpreted in the setting of clinical situation and an initial evaluation of the patient with abnormal LFTs should take into account the clinical picture, patient symptoms, risk factors, medication history, past and current medical history, and physical examination findings. Quantitative liver function tests are helpful in evaluation of metabolic and excretory functions of the liver. Thank you. So this topic is so huge that you could have a day-long uh, seminar just on every component of the test of liver function. So what Dr. Ajay has done in the last half an hour or so is to run you through the gamut. So if you saw those cases, the gentleman with alcohol use disorder, nothing much changed. It's only that his INR got a little better and his acute kidney injury got better. But if you see the test of liver function did not change much. So basically the the... So the, it's, it's a misnomer to say that these are liver function tests. Truly, they are not liver function tests. We should call them liver chemistry tests. So they do not tell you the complete picture in a given patient. So if I was to throw a very simple question to you, to this audience, that what do you think would be the liver function test of a cirrhotic patient be like? Someone who's got compensated cirrhosis, what do we think would be the patient's liver function test be like? In all probability, it would be normal. All right, so it's just that you will have that AST to ALT ratio, which Dr. Uh, Ajay alluded to, that that ratio would be greater than two to one, but that apart, you might see nothing uh, really different. So this is an old gimmick. Every time I have to give a talk, I always ask my colleagues also to prepare a slide set to see how ours would be any different. So I'm not going to bore you with this, but just to tell you that I also prepared some slides. So the, the important thing to remember is that this is, this is a kind of a summary slide. So the differential diagnosis, so everybody wants entertainment. Differential diagnosis of somebody having an AST of more than 10,000, there are only a few things which can produce that. Paracetamol, herpes simplex, varicella zoster, ischemic hepatitis. So these are the only differential diagnosis of somebody having enzymes in tens of thousands. You do not get it in any other condition. Similarly, equally relevant is how quickly do these enzymes fall? So oftentimes you must be led into believing that if the enzymes are falling quickly, that is good. The answer is no. So only in ischemic hepatitis, you also go with the trajectory in the drop of the enzyme. So typically in ischemic hepatitis, the enzymes will keep dropping by about 50%. So if the first day was 11,000, the next day should be 5,000. Whereas if the same situation is happening in, say, somebody with herpes simplex viral hepatitis, the first day was 11,000 and the next day is 5,000, that's doomsday. Because that means there aren't enough liver cells to die. And that is why your enzymes have dropped down to less than half. So therefore, the interpretation of tests of liver function should be contextual. The other important thing for the practitioners is the correlation between a prolonged INR, which all of us, are, of us swear by, so like Dr. Rajay mentioned that it's a kind of a severity marker to tell you how bad the liver disease is. But please remember, most liver disease patients are actually not hypocoagulable, they are hypercoagulable because the liver also does not synthesize every single factor other than eight. So do you keep talking about only two, five, seven, nine, ten? 10, but every single clotting factor is synthesized in the liver other than factor eight, which is synthesized by the endothelium. But the liver also synthesizes the anticoagulants. So in the form of protein C, protein S, antithrombin. So therefore, it is a kind of a balanced hemostasis in patients with liver disease. So oftentimes, you will see patient who'd got a prolonged INR, just poor chap needed a lymph node biopsy. And I'm giving you a true life example. In a city hospital only, somebody's INR was 1.8. He was transfused 16 units of FFP just for a lymph node biopsy. This was not so long ago. All right. So you can never correct the INR. It is only a value. And it is impossible for you to be correcting the INR. However, to say that the INR was because of an impaired absorption in which the bile salts are implicated, in which cholestasis is implicated, if you give this patient, don't, don't change the presentation, don't change the presentation. If you give this patient vitamin K, there would be an improvement in the prothrombin time value. All right, it would be at least 30% or thereabouts. Whereas if it is a parenchymal disease, vitamin K is not going to help you. So 
you classify into the cholestatic pattern and the hepatocellular pattern, which is what Dr. Uh, Ajay alluded to. But important thing is that a normal LFT does not mean that you do not have a liver disease, and a very abnormal LFT also does not mean that you have a liver disease. So we will talk about this. So this is, this is what I was trying to say. A decrease in value does not mean improvement, and limitation is there in sensitivity and specificity. So that is why the technical term should be a liver chemistry test. Now, what is a normal ALT? All of you who work on the laboratory medicine side, they would be seeing a value which is given by the side of the AST and ALT, which would be anywhere from 10 to 35 or 10 to 14. Some labs have got values even up to 60. But most labs would have these values which I just mentioned. Please remember that is not the normal value. The normal value of ALT is much lower. For men, it is about 30 or 31, and for women, it is 19. So please remember it's a normally distributed parameter. This is a landmark study which was published in the annals many years ago. It is also called the Prati's study. And this study, they took only normal people. Now, if you pick up 100 people from the general population or off the street who are absolutely fit and healthy and have no health issues, you will find that a proportion of them will have abnormal enzymes. A pro proportion of them will also have elevated bilirubin values. I can bet on it that we, as biochemistry folks, never ever pay attention to the bilirubin value. So please go back to your labs and see in the last three months how many patients had got a bilirubin value of more than one. You would be surprised. So the normal bilirubin is less than one. Dr. Rajay already told you that most of it is, is conjugated, unconjugated. So that's what I said, we'll check whether you're sleeping or not sleeping. Conjugated, unconjugated? Unconjugated. So what is the liver doing? <laughs> All right, so less than one, 15% or thereabouts only should be unconjugated. There are various ways of assessing the bilirubin. The best way is HPLC, which we do not do, and many labs will still go by the diazo reaction. So you merge the total bilirubin, and you also measure by subtracting with that the conjugated, you get the unconjugated fraction. If you have got an increased unconjugated fraction, that is called indirect hyperbilirubinemia. If more than 80% is conjugated, you call it conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The commonest cause of an abnormal bilirubin in the general population is? Gilbert syndrome. Written as Gilbert's, but pronounced as Gilbert's. So this is a, this is a genetic disorder in which it's the bilirubin transport which is defective. And that is why you get predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The values will be less than five, so don't lose your sleep over it. The transaminases will be normal. You have to reassure the patient that the bilirubin is not coming from the liver. Which is the easiest test to do that? Which is the easiest test to say that the bilirubin is not coming from the liver? That is a urine examination. So you will not get any bilirubin in the urine because unconjugated bilirubin does not get excreted in the urine. It's only the conjugated bilirubin which gets excreted in the urine. And most hepatic disorders, I am not saying all, most hepatic disorders are associated with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So even before you turn yellow in the eyes, your urine might turn yellow. And you will have bilirubin which would be there in the urine. So that is why for a biochemist, even if you are working in a resource-constrained environment, you can very easily pick these nuances and be able to make a diagnosis. So coming back to the mood question, normal enzymes are not 40 or 45. Normal enzymes are much, much lower in that. In women, about 20, and in men, about 30. Please remember that even in this 20, there is a difference between less than 0.5 and more than 0.5. So in liver transplant, we talk about what is called as a supernormal LFT. So you can have post-transplant patients who will have single-digit transaminases. And then the same patient, if you try to tweak the immunosuppression, will have enzymes in 20s and 30s, which is still acceptable to you. But if you were to biopsy this patient, you will see some telltale signs of rejection. But I am not telling you that you enhance immunosuppression. All I am trying to drive home is that there is something called a supernormal LFT also, which would be single-digit transaminases. So this study, you should definitely go and read, because this was the first time that we realized that the normal values of transaminases are not what we think they are. So I requested Dr. Madhusudan to stay back, and Dr. Tarun also 
thanks so much that he could come because I was telling him that I am not able to stimulate a good enough discussion. Now just go through this case, it is, it is, it is what the interpretation of liver function test, it can be so exhilarating. I, I, I wish there were more clinicians in this audience. So this is a young man who gets stabbed in the abdomen in a roadside brawl and he's brought to the ER bleeding profusely from his abdominal wound. He is hypotensive, shocked, cold, clammy skin, peripheries. They are barely able to feel the pulse. They are not able to record the blood pressure. The labs are drawn, which typically happens in the ER. And the values you can see, AST of 56, ALT 48, serum bilirubin of 1.2, direct fraction 0.3. He is taken up for an emergency laparotomy. Peroperatively, the surgeons find that there is fecal soiling. He has a gangrenous bowel and a vascular injury. He receives significant transfusions during the surgery. He is shifted to the intensive care and he is initiated on parental nutrition because you know that you are not going to be able to use this bowel. You could argue that I will not give parental nutrition, but just to build the case, I am telling you, first 48 hours actually we would not. But if you know that this bowel is not going to be used, you are well within your rights to start at time point zero two. The LFTs on POD2 are AST of 1600. ALT of 560, alkaline phosphatase 180, serum bilirubin of 2.9 with a direct of 0.5. So what do you think it means? So significant hypotension, ischemic. So this is ischemic hepatitis. You will have enzymes running into thousands. Bilirubin values will be mildly elevated. They might not be elevated and it would be unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So in the same patient, you saw what the baseline was and what has happened two days later. On POD5, like I said, ischemic hepatitis, tuck, 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 they start coming down very quickly. AST is 118, alkaline, ALT is 57, alkaline phosphate is 108, bilirubin 2.7. So it's, it's almost the same as it was on POD2. On POD9, he becomes tachycardic, tachypnic, febrile, and the surgeon finds that two sutures have given way. On this day, his enzymes are AST 178, ALT 87, ALKFOS 334, bilirubin has gone up to 3.6 with a direct fraction of 2.7. Cultures were taken from the wound site as well as the blood cultures were taken and his antimicrobials were changed. The patient responds to the change in antibiotics. So what do you think is caused this difference in enzymes? Sepsis. So please remember, in the general population, the incidence of abnormal LFTs is about 2 to 5 percent. In the ICU, it is 15 to 20 percent. So the common consults in an ICU are almost invariably because of abnormal LFTs, but our ICU physicians are very astute and they can most of the times, you know, wrap their heads around what is going on. So this is a classic LFT of a patient who's septic. Cholestatic enzymes go up, bilirubin goes up, AST more than ALT. Dr. Ajay already told you that AST is a non-specific enzyme, predominantly mitochondrial, and that is why you see that the whole LFT has changed. He responds to antibiotics, he becomes afebrile, the white cell count and the inflammatory markers settle. His TPN is continued on POD12. You can see that the liver function tests probably seem to have again touched the baseline. On POD18, the nursing staff reports that when she drew the sample in the morning, there was an odd color of the blood she drew. And her LFT, and his LFTs are AST of 134, ALT 77, ALKFOS 356, Gamma GT 224, and a bilirubin of 2.9. So what do you think is going on? So this is parental nutrition related cholestasis. So normally this sets in at about 10 to 14 days after we have given parental nutrition to a given patient and classically you see features of cholestasis. So alk 5 FOS and gamma GT would be much more elevated than the transaminases and the serum bilirubin values will be elevated. So you can see that in just about 18 days, you have various sets of liver function in the same patient. So what would you do in a patient like this? So we have to see whether the bowel can be used. You can start regimental feeds or not. Otherwise, you shift from a soya-based lipid. So lipids are the culprit. So traditionally, it was thought that the TPN-related cholestasis only happens in children. The answer is no. It happens in adults too. Normally, you should not suspect it any time in the first week after starting TPN, and then you switch from the soya-based lipids to the, 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 fat, uh, the fish oil-based uh, lipids, and that should do the trick for you. So 
one patient, different sets of liver function test, and you can see how this whole thing evolves. Second case, male executive, you already heard the NAFL story from Dr. Ramana also and from Dr. Rajay, one of the commonest causes of abnormal liver enzymes, ALT more than AST. But in the same patient whom you have been following, if over a period of time the AST becomes more than ALT, then you have to refer him to a liver physician. So ALT more than AST is the traditional NAFL LFT, but if AST is becoming more than ALT, that means the fibrosis is getting advanced. This patient probably might be progressing to cirrhosis and therefore you must have this patient be seen by a liver specialist. So this under fellow undergoes a health check. The ultrasound shows that the liver is ecogenic. His, his baseline liver function test are AST 56, ALT 72, ALK 112, Gamma GT 134, Bilrubin, which is near normal. Triglycerides of 355, LDL 185. He is advised weight reduction diet and a regular exercise regimen. He goes to the gym with a vengeance, works out on the treadmill almost two hours a day. Six weeks later, he wants to show himself off that yes, I have done enough in the gym, I will go and repeat my blood works. He goes to the lab and has his blood drawn. Lo and behold, AST 383, ALT 96, ALKFOS 108, GGT 122, bill of 0.9, direct of 0.2. So what do you think is going on? So this is exercise related AST elevation. So you can have even AST going up to four digits also. So this is not at all uncommon. So there are two situations in which an elevated AST might not, you, you need, don't need to break a sweat. One is what is called as a macro AST, which the biochemistry colleagues will go and read about it and then let me know next time when we ever meet, what is the meaning of that. And second is the exercise induced AST. So you can have a significant elevation in AST just by exercising hard. So what other test can tell us that yes, this is exercise induced only and not anything else? Yeah. So you can use the CPK, you can use the LDH. Okay, so these are the two enzymes that you can use and that will also tell you that yes, this is exercise induced. Two months later, this patient reports to his GP with nausea and vomiting, upper abdominal discomfort and high colored urine. So in this duration of rigorous exercising and lifestyle routine, he's lost about 12 kgs of weight. His LFTs are AST 103, ALT 185, ALKFOS 282, bilirubin of 2.6. So what do you think is going on? So I could give you 10 different shades to this case. So I could also say that he's been started on a weight reduction pill and then he presents to the doctor. So please remember, this is probably a rapid weight loss induced gallstone formation. Not at all uncommon. So if you see, what I am trying to suggest here, he's developed features of pain. Normally, the hepatitic causes of elevated enzymes are painless. That is what I was taught in the med school. It is wrong. It's not the whole truth, but that is what you should remember. So even when in acute viral hepatitis, you get a big liver, you know the liver is not sensitive to pain other than the liver's capsules, the glycine capsule. Even if you cut through the liver, it won't cause pain. But if the capsule gets stretched, you get pain. But traditionally, you would also be have been taught in the med school that the hepatic causes are painless. But this particular patient is having right upper quadrant pain, has developed choleuria. Now you see ALT more than AST. That is typical biliary pattern of enzyme elevation. So this patient should undergo a scanning and if gallstones are found, what do you do? You can start him on URSO. So this is a patient who might respond to URSO. So please remember in certain situations, URSO is a good drug to dissolve lithiasis. In most instances it is not, but this is one of the conditions in which you can have this happening. So I think I will leave this because Dr. Rajay already spoke about this, so painless progressive. So the history and the context is extremely important. Elderly person, always think about obstructive disorders, always think of malignancy. In a young patient, go with the background history. What was he taking? What were the drugs history like? Has there been any use of uh, complementary alternative medicine? so on and so forth. So the, the age and the context in which the tests of liver function are being checked is also very relevant. Now this is again something which is extremely relevant because you would see in your practice. So we know that many of our patients who receive anti-tubercular medication, when you have got an established TB, they would be treated with the standard combination which is RHEZ 
for sensitive TB. So please remember when you use these drugs, there is almost a 15 to 20 percent chance of enzyme elevation. But you do not stop these medications. So there are select conditions in which you would stop this condition, these medications, but this case exemplifies that. So the AST jumped up to 350. So if you have got an enzyme elevation which goes to triple digit or the bilirubin crosses 2, this is the high is law, high H Y apostrophe S, high is law, then this patient you must stop the medication. And you found, so what do you think it is due to? It is drug induced liver injury, which is the most hepatotoxic drug in the RHEZ regimen. Yeah, so I, I knew everybody would say that. So the most hepatotoxic drug is pyrazinamide. The commonest drug to produce LFT abnormality is isoniazid. But the most, the commonest, the, 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 the most hepatotoxic drugs out of the four drugs is pyrazinamide. So two weeks later, the tests of liver function show that the enzymes have come down. The AST is 95, ALT is 88, alkaline phosphatase is 156, and the bilirubin has come to 1.5. So what do you do in a patient like this? You restart, okay? So there is in drug induced liver injury, all drugs are not the same. So you can always re-challenge. So normally you would hear or read that in drug induced liver injury, you should not re-challenge, but it just depends on the severity of the initial insult. So supposing I had told you that this patient developed an INR of 2.5, lactates climbed up to five and became encephalopathic, you are not going to restart. But it is only a blip in the transaminases and they have settled after cessation of drug. So there is a method in the madness, there is a way of reintroducing the ATT, but this patient in most instances would be able to tolerate the full dose of ATT. So I would end here, and I would like to have you ask some questions. Thank you very much. Yes. KD patients, uh, and it's not uncommon, quite yeah. common. Yeah. So do you have any explanation for that? Right, so this is a wonderful question for those of you in practice in nephrology. Dialysis patients especially, not CKD. So CKD patients on dialysis will typically have enzymes which will be running in single digits. So this is mostly to do with the enzyme pathways related to pyridoxal phosphate. That is the explanation which is given in biochemical tests. For the same reason as in an alcoholic, the AST, ALT never climbs to more than 500. But the relevance to a nephrology, a nephrology practice is that if in the same person, your 6 or 7 is becoming 14, 15, even though it is in the normal range, have a low threshold to run his viral markers because this patient is exposed to dialysis on a regular basis. So single digit enzymes are not uncommon in patients who are on maintenance hemodialysis. And in these patients, if these enzymes, even though they remain within the normal range, but if they show an increasing or creeping up trend, you should have a low threshold to do the molecular test. So we know that in CKD patients, the serological test might not give us the, 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 the output that we need. So you should, there should be a low threshold to check them for the viruses. But the pathophysiology is believed to be the pathways which lead to the, the, the transamination reaction for which the pyridoxal phosphate is a cofactor. Yes, it will not be seen in CKD. I don't know. This, this is the, this is the, this is the, this is what is mentioned in text. So again, this is also very intriguing. Why an alcoholic hepatitic should not have an enzyme more than 400? So if an alcoholic hepatitic has got an enzyme of more than 400, you think of twin di diagnosis. So these are poorly defined explanations, but the explanation is with the cofactor for the transamination reaction. I am Dr. Sujan from Usmanaya General Hospital, General Medicine. My question is to you, about uh, can we start uh, step by step, can we introduce all the ATT drugs after this uh, liver injury pattern, after the settlement of uh, AST and ADT? Yeah, I won't. Ma one I said, I, that's why I said, so there is a way of doing it. Okay. Yeah. Another question is, uh, can you just highlight the uh, liver, uh, liver injury abnormalities in uh, some uh, tropical infections like uh, malaria and uh, leptospirosis? Uh, Right. Yes. So, so these are the, we call them tropical hepatopathies. Yes. So we don't call them traditionally hepatitis. So the, the reason why 
these produce abnormalities in tests of liver function is not clearly known we still believe that it is due to cytokines though there are reports of even the portal tracts being infiltrated by the malarial parasite and its and its life cycle components but most of us believe that it's a cytokine mediated injury in typical patients with dengue and leptospira so dengue there is a component of a, a hypotension so you will see a kind of a mixed picture ast more than alt mild elevation of bilirubin generally these patients will have a very prominent sers reaction also and generally they will also have acute kidney injury in leptospira the enzyme elevation is much more muted compared to dengue and you have features of aki and hyperbilirubinemia which is again predominantly conjugated so in dengue to start off with you will have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia but if other things supervene it can become conjugated too in leptospira typically aki at outset the marginal increase in transaminases and the presence of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia but most of the times other organs will also be affected yes so in so the in malaria it is it is because of the rbc infestation so you will have predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia it is only later on that this patient can also have some super added infections which is not uncommon in severe malaria cases that the bilirubin shifts to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia depending on what also is so please remember that ast is a red cell enzyme so you get ast elevation in hemolysis too so you could have a significant malarial infestation and you can have enzymes running into three or four digits also but and what are the issues they're not very common they're common with the yes so unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia with ast elevation is the commonest so ditto in dengue dengue most of the times it's the hemodynamics and the cytokines which produce this Step by step, and after a period of one week is over for the patient, we do reintroduction of the complete ATT for the patient. That is uh, one thing, and I think sir has alluded about the lot of examples are there. Uh, I think only request to the microbiologist. Uh, we should get the questions from your side why this lab test is abnormal. Like this, we are sending the test to the pathology. Pathologist always asks, "What is the clinical history is there?" Just now discussing with the sir, one of the patient having lymphadenopathy. We wanted to start the steroids. That my other doubt was there whether the patient having lymphoma or not. in the same way i think the laboratory people should call to the clinicians and find out why this abnormal test is there try to clear it clinically for the patient and we can give some differential diagnosis maybe one two three things are there so that we have more coordination and more clinical discussion for the patients so i'll just add few words to the question uh, the this uh, resident doctor from uh, osmania asks that they restarting the atd you know the uh, ckd patients have more tendency to have a atd induced hepatitis and many of our patients develop tuberculosis and we treat them and once they develop uh, you know high bilirubin or or move very high uh, sgpt more than 2 to 3 times of the normal limit we definitely stop all the drugs and we reintroduce once the bilirubin is normal we reintroduce with first with inh lowest dose then we frequently monitor and step up the dose reach maximum 300 mg dose then after that we restart rifampicin and reach the dose i do not know i may be wrong in the rifampicin whether we should start it the full dose on day one or or build up that uh, the mes can tell but most of the time we do not disturb them because we need to talk to them very frequently because every 3 or 7 days you do the test and then hike up the dose every time you cannot call them you need to have their your own knowledge to do it because you cannot send the patient to the hepatologist every 3 days that you go and uh, take their opinion so we do it on our own so we give inh rivampicin other drugs we commonly use the combutor or 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 or, or, or even streptomycin I, i i prefer streptomycin because that's the least nephrotoxic drug and it's a bactericidal drug as compared to the other you know like combutor so uh, 
generally I, I avoid giving pyrogenamide. Do not introduce it. Because all, our patients are, most of them are malnourished and, and, and uh, CKD, I have seen they have they move very frequently developed ITD induced hepatitis. Dharmes can correct me if I'm wrong. So in the similar vein, which is the least hepatotoxic drugs amongst the RHZ, it is rifampicin. So we know that rifampicin is used to treat the cholestasis of a commonly known condition to most of you, which is primary biliary cholangitis. All right, so you use rifampicin all the time to treat the cholestasis in this condition in which there is marked pruritus. So the least hepatotoxic drug is rifampicin. But I will again want to say that the answer to this question cannot be a general statement. So for us, it depends on what triggered or what presented, what got this patient to you. Supposing somebody has got only a transaminitis reaction, my first drug would be rifampicin to reinitiate. If somebody had a predominantly hyperbilirubinemic hepatotoxicity, the first drug would be isoniazide. Always start in low doses and gradually increase. And pyrazinamide would be the last drug to use. If your patient has got cavitatory cox or this patient has got a proven TB and it's not just based on imaging, aminoglycosides are good drugs to use even in the context of renal dysfunction, once you know your act well. So it is not as if to say that if you give streptomycin to someone, tomorrow his creatinine is going to climb. Sidal drug is streptomycin, so I completely agree with Dr. Zarun. That's a good drug to use. Ethambutol is also nephrotoxic, not at all hepatotoxic, but that the, again, the dose has to be modified and it's only a static drug. All right? So I, I hope I am able to convey the answer. High enzymes, start with rifampicin. High bilirubin, start with INH. Pyrazinamide should be the last drug to use. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Nabila from Nizam Institute. Uh, thank you for a very enlightening presentation, sir. My, uh, I wanted to know your views on what could be uh, the future of proteomic analysis on novel circular RNA biomarkers uh, over liver biopsy, or liver biopsy is going to be the gold standard for a very long time. And I, th I think from your institution, you are only asking, uh, throwing googlies and asking very uh, difficult questions. So if I were to be given the choice to go back to the med school again, the subjects that I would opt for would be genetics, biochemistry, your practice, what do you and molecular biology. I'm answering your question. <laughs> All right? So I would have, I would like only these three subjects in my curriculum. So again, biochemistry, molecular biology, and genetics. But would I be giving this answer, say, 25 years ago? Probably the answer is no. Because I like these subjects only because I'm interacting with the patients. I hope that answers your question. The answer is no. Okay. All right? So you are, there are so many studies which have been done on what the RNA does to you and the various kinds of the long non-coding uh, mRNAs, miRNAs, you know, circular RNAs. They will still not be able to solve the puzzle for you till such time you have a gold standard. So there are so many tests which were enumerated by Dr. Ramana in a non-invasive assessment of fatty liver disease because that is the biggest killer that the human race uh, faces now, all right? But still, the gold standard continues to remain a liver biopsy. Okay, so metabolomics, proteomics, lipidomics, what have you, every day a new omics starts, but nothing is more important than the human brain and your interaction with the patient sitting in front of you. Also, I wanted to know what are you, uh, what do you th think of the non-invasive tests like fibro scans, or like because some corporates are uh, predominantly using it and some don't go to that level. So I just wanted to know what is it? So I think the, the, the answer lies somewhere in between. So sir told you, and this is probably what our lab should start doing. FIB4 is a test that everybody can do. It's a very, very simple test. It is based only on two biochemical parameters and one hematological parameter. You don't have to pay for it. It's an excellent test. For more advanced cirrhosis, APRI is an excellent test, which you can do very easily. For everything else, you will need some infrastructure. So VCTE is something that people are swearing by because it's a non-invasive test. Liver biopsy is a difficult test and it's even more difficult to read a biopsy. All right, so we are all the time in this hospital, we are doing some studies on fatty liver disease and Milap sir, who's one of the best histopathologists on hepatology and his diagnosis and the diagnosis that we get, say from Singapore and or from Denver would be many a times different. 
So there is a difference of interpretation of the biopsy. The important thing to remember is that all studies have only suggested fibrosis to be a driver of outcome in patients with fatty liver disease and that is why VCT and all the other tests, MRE, so on and so forth, have found their space under the sun. But it does not mean that fat is not important. It does not mean that inflammation or balloon hepatocytes, which are the key markers of hepatocyte injury, are not important. But unfortunately, there is no non-invasive tool to pick up these. So that is why you have to rely on the biopsy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I think we've uh, passed the tea break, <laughs> maybe encroaching on the lunch break. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, enlightening session. I would like to call, I will, we would proceed with the inauguration now. I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Linga, sir, our medical director. Do Dr. Raj Kumar, sir, can you please felicitate Dr. Linga, sir? Okay, first we will proceed with the lamp lighting. I invite all the dignitaries, Dr. Linga, sir, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, sir. Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, sir. Dr. Tarun, sir. Tarun, sir, please come on to the dais for inauguration, lamp lighting. Dr. Gopi Krishna, sir. Radhika, madam. Aparna, madam. Nivedita, madam. Asma, madam. Gulakshmi, madam. Anamika, madam. Sir, Milap, sir. <laughs> Dr. Sri Divya, Dr. Arpita. <laughs> Mr. Rupesh from Ortho Clinical, uh, Quiddle Ortho. <laughs> Mr. Rupesh. <laughs> Raman Vadula sir is not available, he is busy with his OP. I request Dr. Lingaya, sir, to say a few words. Uh, 
a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I should appreciate Dr. Rajkumar Rathod, particularly Dr. Madhavi Madam. Always she is, uh, uh, this type of program she is conducting. I'm very happy. Uh, now this program, very good topics, excellent speakers. All are uh, from different, different organizations they came. They are excellent speakers and the topics are so very good. And uh, Dharmesh Kapoor, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor sir has made uh, I love this thing. I always tell that uh, lab and uh, radiology are going to are very, very important nowadays. Previously, when we studied, it was not that important, but uh, most of the clinicians, they're depending on the lab and diagnosis, uh, lab and radiology only for diagnosis. Exceptional will be there like uh, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor. He knows everything, the encyclopedia of medicine. He knows medicine, surgery, everything, you know, radiology, lab, everything he knows, huh? except the, those, those people. But most of the clinicians, they are depending upon the lab only. So uh, updating of the knowledge is very important. So these programs are we are conducting. We always tell that quality comes with academics. So we give utmost importance to the academics. So we uh, request all our uh, departments, all our doctors, consultants to conduct these type of programs. Uh, uh, we, from the beginning, we give importance to lab and radiology. We do innovative things in the lab and radiology, equipment-wise or everything-wise. Uh, I think, you know, within one hour, giving a report is a very innovative thing in our uh, organization. It, ha it has helped a lot for the patients who come from the districts. So these type of things, I request always uh, our lab people, uh, innovate things. Your clients are, first clients are clinicians. You have to interact with clinicians. I think you have seen this program today with uh, live this thing. Uh, interacting with the clinicians is very, very important. You always talk to them, communicate to them. Uh, then the diagnosis will be better. Uh, updating knowledge is also very, very important. Uh, we, from the beginning, we give importance to the academics. We started nursing college. We, all levels, from all levels, we are uh, conducting academic programs. We started nursing college, nursing schools, DNB programs, uh, paramedical courses to give the best service to the patients. So uh, we have almost 4,000 students, including nursing, paramedical, DNB courses, fellowship courses, all the paramedical, all 4,000 students are uh, studying in our uh, organization now. So this is the uh, at, uh, uh, large scale of things what we do uh, for uh, giving good services to the patients. So my request to all of you, now we have seen those junior doctors who could not answer properly, not ask questions, don't discourage. Uh, if Dharmesh Kapu, Dr. Dharmesh Kapu is a very intelligent person, you don't discourage yourself. But one thing is what I am saying, when you come to a conference, please read. Read the topics, what you are going to listen. So that you can ask one question in a um, uh, session. That will give you more this thing, so you will update your knowledge more. Updating knowledge is very, very important nowadays because uh, people come with Google searches and all those things. Uh, you have, we have to answer them. So uh, updating knowledge is very, very important. I request all our uh, lab people, Rathod and uh, other departments, like histopathology is there, serology, hematology is there, to conduct more and more this program so that we can uh, update knowledge of our people so that patients get better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Rajkumar, sir, to felicitate Dr. Lingaya, sir. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Lingay, sir, to felicitate the speakers. Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, sir. Okay. Dr. Nivedita, madam.
डॉक्टर राधिका डॉक्टर धर्मेश कपूर सर डॉक्टर निवेदिता मैडम डॉक्टर राधिका चौधरी मैम सर लिंगे सर प्लीज फ्यू फ्यू स्पीकर्स मोर सर विल नॉट बी अवेलेबल डॉक्टर अपर्णा मैडम डॉक्टर आसमा मैडम डॉक्टर अनामिका मैम Thank you, sir, for sparing your time. We'll now take a short break for tea and then continue with the sessions.
I request people who are outside to please come on to the, into the room. Please come into the auditorium. We are going to start sessions. Next, Asma. We will be late for the lunch if we spend more time on tea. Can you please come inside?
perisinusoidal fibrosis going on to bridging fibrosis and peripotal fibrosis then it becomes a full fledged cirrhosis so this cirrhosis can progress to hepatocellular carcinoma also and it has been found that 40% of non alcoholic fatty liver disease related hepatocellular carcinoma did not have cirrhosis so that is also one finding the prevalence was uh, widely talked about by dr ramana again uh, and uh, one thing that i would like to focus more on is the adolescent and young population worldwide uh, which shows a prevalence of above 92 9 to 37% which is a good number and it is mostly attributed to other dietary part that is being take, taken by these kiddos nowadays so the one most important culprit i want to highlight is your fructose as you can see the cereals what you are getting nowadays though they say it is sugar free or um, uh, there no additives or aspartame but when you read the fine print they'll be given fructose corn syrup so this has been attributed to the uh, emergence or the development of nash because that is a high caloric sweetener then second is your high caloric beverages your soft drinks which are normally consumed then third will be um, red meat or, or the mediterranean diet so these are one or uh, these are few of the, and the processed food of course so mostly it is a preventable disease and uh, the dietary factors in addition to sedentary lifestyle has added on to the increased incidence of this disease this uh, this is a new term as uh, told by dr ramna again uh, this has been coined and it's called as a metabolic associated fatty liver disease i will not go much into it but i'll just say that uh, about the lean um, nafld now the lean nafld has similar biochemical features except that the body mass index is less than 23 kg per meter square in asians and less than 25 kg per meter square in european but and uh, and again the epidemiological survey has shown that this incidence is also 32.4% and the complications and the progression and the clinical impact is similar to your classical nafld so one thing is the visceral fat is more more is more closely associated with metabolic syndrome we know that the nafld is because of the accumulation of the triglycerides or the lipid multiple surplus lipid of influx into the liver and adipose tissue which gets spilled over over to the all ectopic sites like your omentum pancreas skeletal muscles so this becomes a source of uh, uh, source of again uh, secretion of uh, cytokines and as well as uh, it uh, interferes with the insulin signaling thereby causing nfld so and another driver is your genotype this pattern like uh, phospholipase a3 cg and gg genotypes are specifically associated with the nfld development in lean people then these are the primary causes of uh, classical nfld where you can see as i said it is obesity caloric excess inactive exercise plus um, adipose tissue dysfunction and uh, these two are the main criteria which in turn cause insulin resistance and the main drivers of this are associated drivers are your mitochondrial dysfunction er stress gut microbiome as well as the genetic factors which i will uh, refresh during the course of the uh, of this uh, session so according to this theory insulin resistance genetic and epigenetic factors and mitochondrial dysfunction er stress intestinal microbiome and cro chronic low grade inflammation and dysfunction all represent synchronic causes of both nfld development and progression the initiating event is the intrahepatic accumulation of fatty acid dietary factors like carbohydrate surplus with high intake of red meat fructose containing foods and high calorie drinks along with the sedentary lifestyle and this regulation of peripheral lipolysis dnl that is de novo lipogenesis causes the increased free fatty acid flux within the liver that plays hepatocytes another hip lipotoxic condition 
These lipotoxic free fatty acids are partitioned in the liver into inner intracellular triacyl glycerol for storage via acyl-CoA synthetic activity and mitochondrial beta oxidation. Many patients could stay in this for years, but when the chronic insults ultimately exceed the hepatic uh, capacity to deal with the overload, they progress to NASH. So the pathophysiology of NFLD is complex and multifactorial. It is not just simple because it involves multiple systemic alterations and involves several fundamental biochemical and immunological process rather than the traditional sequential two-hit hypothesis which was given earlier. So one of the crucial events clearly involved in NLD progression is the lipotoxicity resulting from an excessive fatty acid flux to hepatocytes. And the primary insult of lipid excess is followed by variable contributions from pathogenic drivers such as lipotoxicity, and immune system activation. And then there are disease modifiers, that is your genetic conditions, alcohol, and then gut dysbiosis. So the sources, I said the lipotoxic accumulation is the main cause. So the sources of N non esterified fatty acid or the lipid influx into the hepatocyte is the free fatty acids that are delivered to the liver. And about 59% are from the circulating free fatty acid that is through lipolysis from the adipose tissue and dietary, uh, sorry, from the adipose tissue only, and then followed by 26% from the denopolipogenesis, and 14% come from the dietary fat. So the overview, just giving an overview of hepatic lipid metabolism. So um, hepatic lipid acquisition and disposal, um, it is mainly governed by the balance between the four pathways of hepatic lipid homeostasis. One is your uh, beta oxidation, free fatty, uh, this de novo lipogenesis, the excretion, and the dietary absorption. So one uptake of circulating free fatty acid is facilitated by specific fatty acid transporters located in the hepatocyte plasma membrane and is regulated by PPAR gamma. Then de novo lipogenesis converts acetyl coenzyme A, originating also from excess carbohydrate to new fatty acid, which subsequently get exterified and is stored as triglycerides. So free fatty acids are disposed of through oxidation or beta oxidation in the mitochondria, pedioxisomes, and cytochromes. And uh, they can also be passed out as very low density lipoprotein particles in the circulation. So the pathogenesis of NASH is mainly your lipotoxicity and immune-mediated activation. So saturated fatty acid, when, the, when there is increased influx of fatty acids from peripheral circulation into the liver, there are certain fatty acids which are saturated and ha have the capability to induce inflammation and hepatocyte apoptosis through activation of JNK pathway or endoreticulum stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, oxidative stress, or mitochondrial dysfunction. Secondly, the diacylglycerol and ceramide that is also generated through these pathways, it gets uh, accumulated in the liver and it impairs hepatic insulin signaling and fuels gluconeogenesis and promotes the development of persisting hyperglycemia and eventually type 2 diabetes. Then activation, the, this is, uh, shows the immune activation, that is the uh, role of uh, immune, immune cells that take part in the pathogenesis apart from lipotoxicity. So lipotoxicity causes significant hepatocyte injury that leads to inflammation, subsequently bringing the Kuffer cells and other immune cells to the battlefield. So uncontrollable lipotoxicity facilitates reactive oxygen species formation ER stress and hepatocellular dysfunction, immune and apoptotic pathway activation that results in cell death, which further drive fibrosis development over time. So uh, with all the pathways, you will see there is an immune cell activation, the activation of cytokines, which in turn leads to a cascade of events, which eventually leads to cell death and fibrosis. Now, adipose tissue plays an important role in uh, NFLD from, uh, na uh, to NASH progression. So as we know that it is a physical reservoir of fatty acid, 
and it is a complex metabolically active organ that secretes adipocytokine that play a crucial role in regulating insulin sensitivity. And it's hypertrophy due to, in, uh, due to increased influx from uh, fatty acids or triglycerides or lipids. It causes disturbances in lipid metabolism and alterations in endocrine function, which promote low-grade inflammation and insulin resistance in the liver, skeletal muscles, and, over t and other tissues. In addition to that, the storage ability of adipose tissue is overwhelmed during increased influx, and the, spillover and the lipids spill over in the circulation and accumulate in the non-adipose tissue site. And these are called ectopic fat storage site. So the endocrine function of these adipose tissue, as stated, are altered, and the ensuing accumulation of ectopic fat leads to, again, lipotoxicity, which, again, promotes low-grade inflammation, as said earlier. Now, the adipose tissue dysfunction, so um, as you can see, the ectopic fat that is gets uh, uh, deposited at, at sites like omentum, pancreas, skeletal muscles, or uh, liver, um, it recruits macrophages, and it dysregulates adipokines, and it's abrogate insulin signaling and impairs insulin-mediated suppression of lipolysis, leading to increased flux of free fatty acid from adipocytes to other tissue. Now, increased glucose tolerance develops secondary to increased free fatty acid flux to muscles and suppression of glucose uptake. So pancreatic beta cells compensate by increasing insulin secretion, again leading to hyperinsulinemia. Now, de novo lipogenesis is stimulated due to hyperinsulinemia in the liver, and diacylglycerol, which is a toxic lipotoxic intermediate, uh, also contributes to hepatic IR because that starts getting accumulated. Now, the, again, this a fat that is gets uh, uh, ectopically placed and uh, undergoes hyperplasia and hypertrophy, it, oh, as I said, it oh, produces uh, adipocytokines, leptin, and resistin, and reduces the release of anti-inflammatory adipokines, such as adiponectin. So again, it secretes, it recruits the macrophages, and uh, causes the, um, um, uh, activates the two pro-inflammatory pathways, the nuclear factor KB and JNK pathway. And tumor necrosis factor alpha also interferes with insulin signaling and contribute to hepatic inflammation. So uh, these pathways, uh, later they go on to cause the induction of apoptosis and development of NASH. So that is how the role of adipose tissue goes in the progression of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to NASH by recruiting macrophages, by altering the um, uh, secretion of the adipocytokines and uh, hampering the, interfering with the insulin signaling. And then activating the inflammatory pathways that leads to a cascade of events, again leading to apoptosis, cell death, and subsequently to fibrosis. So gut dysbiosis is a disease modifier so what happens is, it has been found that in the patient with NAFL, there is a change in the gut microbiome. Uh, normally, uh, and uh, this microbiome is alcohol producing. So indirectly, though the patient may not be consuming alcohol, but there will be increase in the ethanol levels, which again contribute to the, which go follow the alcohol metabolism and again contribute to the development of the NAF, uh, progression of NFLD2 NASH. S and then there is increased absorption of short-chain fatty acid because of the um, change in the biome, and they stimulate nutrient ab absorption, favoring obesity and steatosis. Then there is disruption of intercellular tight junctions, in which increases intestinal permeability, permitting translocation of bacterial lipopolysaccharide into the circulation. Now, this is, again, an important factor. LPS attacks as a toll-like receptor with consequent activation of the inflammatory cascade and action on um, insulin signal, and thereby causing obesity, liver fat accumulation, and development and progression towards NASH. Dietary choline is, again, a factor which gets converted into toxic compound called methylamine, and that also causes liver injury, and then, again, the progression. 
Then another uh, modifier is your gene variants. That is your phosphatatin like phospholipase domain containing protein three. There happens a single poly, um, nucleotide polymorphism where um, um, there is a substitution of isoleucine to methionine at position 148, which encodes for a lipid droplet protein and produces a truncated lipase enzyme, which impedes triglyceride breakdown and subsequently causes um, liver triglyceride secretion and increases the hepatic fat accumulation. Then apart from that, there are other two uh, uh, genes that are involved in this uh, <coughs> in this scenario. Then going on to mitochondrial dysfunction and ER stress. Uh, because of um, increased influx of triglycerides, the mitochondrial system gets paralyzed and that causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, that leads to impairment of lipid hem homeostasis. And then again, generation of further toxic metabolites and overproduction of reactive oxygen species. ER stress occurs upon excessive accumulation of unfolded and misfolded proteins in the ER, sorry, in the ER, or when ER calcium is depleted. So as a consequent, free, free fatty acid activate apoptotic cascade, thus promoting tissue damage and inflammation. Altogether, these molecular events contribute to progression, NAFLD progression. Then, um, this disease progression, once NASH has, NASH has been established, it progresses to cirrhosis. The, um, the triadic lesion in the pathogenesis is hepatic site injury, macrophage mediated inflammation, and hepatocyte stellate cell activation. When this hepatocyte cell stellate activation occurs, then the condition progresses to fibrosis, and then it becomes irreversible. So alcohol, uh, now going on to the alcohol metabolism, with that we wound up with the uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease biochemical pathway. Now coming on to the alcohol metabolism, um, as we know that um, alcohol ethanol is converted in the presence of acetyl dehydrogenase to acetaldehyde, and then the acetate is taken up and it goes into the circulation. And um, The biochemical pathway is similar to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, except that uh, uh, the major factor is the initiation of the inflammatory response by resident macrophages of the liver, that is copper cells, and lipopolysaccharide, the, what I said, lipo bacterial lipopolysaccharide, that is a cell wall component of gram negative that translocate from the gut, and it causes the, again, the cascade of whole inflammation and progression to fibrosis. With that, I wind up the presentation. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am, for your detailed presentation. Any questions from the audience? If there are no questions, we will proceed to the next session. The next session is Electrolyte Imbalance in Liver Disease by Dr. Radhika Madam. Radhika Madam is Lab Director, Kim's Hospitals. Please welcome. Good afternoon. I think my topic is just before lunch, so I hope you people listen. 
And uh, when Dr. Mahadvi called me in the last month, August, and she said electrolyte abnormalities, then my, I thought, oh my God, no, because I have to prepare for PG again. But when she said liver, I was very happy because <laughs> most of the electrolyte metabolism takes place in the kidney. So liver has a very small role. I mean, I would say small role in terms of electrolytes. So I was happy. And I thank all the biochemists and the lab head of Yashoda group for accepting me and inviting me to be a speaker on electrolyte imbalance. And I hope Madhvi doesn't invite me for kidney transplant because that's a PG topic again. On the lighter side, I will. Ah. So I have taken only these four because uh, most of the uh, textbooks say even calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and then it becomes an extensive topic if I take all the electrolytes. But generally, these are the four main electrolytes which we see when we talk of electrolytes. Sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. So why are electrolytes so essential? We have one whole organ donated, I mean, uh, taking care of the electrolytes of the body. So they are important because they involve in a lot of processes like volume and osmotic regulation, myocardial rhythm, and contractility. You know uh, what happens when the pH or the acid acidosis and alkalosis when the pH changes? So acid-base balance uh, and based on neuromuscular excitability and contraction of the heart. So for all these, these electrolytes are very important in different aspects. Sodium, as you all know, it's the major extracellular cation, which almost contributes to 90%. And the main uh, function of sodium is maintaining the water and electrolytes balance, electrolyte balance. And this is mainly controlled by sodium ATPase, for sodium potassium ATPase ion pump, because sodium can freely dis diffuse through the cell, but it has to be prevented to go intracellular, and it, has, it is the main cation which has to be maintained in extracellular compartment. And potassium is the main intracellular cation where it functions uh, the main function of potassium is contraction of skeletal and cardiac muscle, and it decreases the resting membrane potential, and it's regulated by renal tubular reabsorption and secretion. Chloride, again, is the main extracellular anion, and it is involved in, again, like sodium, in, it almost goes hand in hand with sodium, and is involved in maintaining osmolality, blood volume, and electrical neutrality. Chloride metabolism is again very closely linked with sodium. So what are the different methods we use in our labs? I think all of us have shifted either to indirect ion selective electrodes or direct ion selective electrodes. But when I was a PG in 90s, in Osmania, it was only flame emission spectrophotometry where sodium, potassium used to come. No chloride and uh, no lithium or whatever. Now the machines have chloride, ionized calcium, lithium. So all these electrodes are available for quick analysis. And of course, bicarbonate in ABG machines. It was not that easy way back in 90s. And as you all know, the sample technique is also very important. Because you know if the sample lyses, you get hyperkalemia because the intracellular potassium leaks into the extracellular and then you get. So the sampling part is very, very important. And all samples can be used for estimation, either plasma, serum, or urine. Urine, sodium, and so urine electrolytes is done mainly for measuring the, ser the urine osmolality, so which is also very important. Now coming to the liver, as all the, my previous speakers were speaking, there are so many functions for the liver. 
it does secretory, it does excretory, it does metabolic functions, and it also detoxifies some drugs. So the complex nature of the liver is very um, difficult for us to say what goes wrong when it goes to transplant. And in liver cirrhosis, there are a lot of electrolyte abnormalities which are depending either to volume status and sodium retention or these changes can result in hyponatremia, hypernatremia or hypokalemia, hyperkalemia and hypometria. So there is a spectrum of disease which can be associated with liver disease. I won't say only hypo or only hyper. It's both. It's a two-side coin. Now coming to liver transplant surgery, which is very frequently happening now in almost all the big hospitals, uh, the average time of the surgery when I asked my surgeon is said, uh, said anywhere between eight to 10 hours. So imagine the stress on the patient for eight to 10 hours, he's on the sedation, sorry, on the anesthetic drugs, which again have some effect on the body. So hypocalcemia is extremely common during the surgery because we infuse a lot of uh, blood products, which include fresh frozen plasma, platelet, and a whole back cell. We don't give whole blood, but now with the advent of all fractions, we are using so many fractions. We almost use around 20 FFPs and 10 plaque pack cells. Of course, this is not standard for all the cases, but generally, if you take an average of the cases which I have done in my hospital, it's coming up to 15 to 20 FFPs and 10 pack cell and three or four single donor platelets. And all of these have some amount of citrate which leads to calcium chelation. Patients with advanced a ASA status, ASA status is a ranking of anesthetists where they say there are five grades in ASA where one is absolutely healthy uh, person and five is a person having severe life-threatening complications. And of course, they have another uh, segment which is ASA 6, which is a diseased donor. So based on their ASA status, they, the anesthetist or the surgeon uh, predict what sort of complications they can get. So with advanced ASA, that is three, four and five, they are more prone to metabolic and acid-based disturbances and without any relation to cold or warm ischemia times. We all know that all warm or cold ischemia has to be done for any organ which is being replaced. And high ASA status, that is ASA 4 and 5, shows an increased risk for cardiovascular collapse after reperfusion. So hyponatremia impairs. What happens when there is hyponatremia or hyperkalemia or whatever? Hyponatremia impairs early post-transplantation outcome in patients with cirrhosis who are undergoing liver transplant. And the, this is done by the suppression of aldosterone release by dexamethasone, which is commonly administered, Impre impairs the renin-angiosterone-aldosterone pathway, thereby inhibiting the restor restorative actions on the so sodium and fluid levels. Since dexamethasone exerts negligible mineralocorticoid therapy, it endangers a risk of hypovolemic hyponatremia. And now coming to the liver transplant per se, this is liver transplant replaces the diseased liver with a transplanted allograft liver. It is either from the live donor or the deceased donor. And has become, this is the now treatment for end stage liver disease as you all know. And the operation itself, the transplant of liver surgery itself is a challenge because you know liver has all the functions, so many functions, so many attachments, venous, circular, lymphatic, sorry, venous, arterial, lymphatic, all sorts of tubes connected to the liver. So liver transplant can be 
associated with a spectrum of technical and medical complications, the recipient's pre-transplantation condition and donor and immunological factors of the donor, and many, or, and many more contributing factors. So if you take the donor, we know do donors are mostly life-related healthy donors or the brain-dead donors. Perioperative factors such as the quality of the donor liver. Nowadays, as my previous speakers already said, there is so much of fatty liver and NASH livers which we see. We do the workup for the entire transplant and then we come to know that the liver is fatty, so they drop, I mean, they don't take the liver. So difficulty of the liver transplantation procedure per se, development of post-operative infection and side effects of immunosuppressive drugs which influence the outcome. And when you come to recipient, they are already sick because of their liver disease. So they have preoperative recipient factors such as age older than 60 years, presence of comorbid conditions such as cardiac or pulmonary disease, renal failure, diabetes, and severe malnutrition. They would have acquired this severe malnutrition malnutrition because of the liver disease also. And the nature of the liver, what, how they landed in liver disease also depends on the uh, survival of the organ in the recipient. So what uh, happens in the ICU stay is there's a very close monitoring in the management of fluid and electrolytes which could be significantly abnormal as a result of prolonged operation and massive fluid shifts. We are giving so much shift, uh, fluid from the external source and also there is a lot of intracellular and extracellular shift of the fluid. These are some of the commonly used drugs. I won't say every patient has the same uh, drugs, but Prograph, which is Stacrolimus, and Visalon, which is again a steroid, are invariably used for all patients in addition to their other drugs. So Prograph, if given, can cause hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, but this drug is very important to prevent transplant rejection. So we have to monitor very closely the fluids and the electrolytes because in 31% of the patients, it causes hyperkalemia, and 22% of the patients, it is hypokalemia. So see how closely it either causes hyper or hypo. And Weisslon or any steroid which they give causes increase in sodium concentration. And hyponatremia, as described, is very, com very uncommon in liver and kidney transplants. But these drugs, which are invariably used for all transplants, by themselves can also cause hypo or hyperkalemia and hypernatremia. And now coming to the electrolytes and lactate, they use a lot of diuretics during surgery, which may also result in hypokalemia. We all know what happens uh, to the metabolism when we start using diuretics on the patient. And Cyclosporin or tacrolimus, mostly they are using TAC now, but for some cases um, they use also cyclosporin and both their drug toxicity causes hyperkalemia, which is again detrimental to the health of the, don uh, of the recipient. Transfusion of citrate-rich bloods result in decreased serum magnesium and calcium magnesium levels should be maintained above 2 milligrams. Above two is for magnesium, not for calcium. Calcium should be around eight. And these should be administered along with the um, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, which are immunosuppressant drugs. Calcium, I'm just adding a note for completion. Calcium should be measured as free ionized calcium and kept above 4.4. What is the normal range of serum ionized calcium? Yeah, maybe not more than two in a normal individual. So this, in transplant patients, that ionized calcium should be maintained above 4.4 milligram per deciliter. 
and transfusion of citrate rich products blood products also results in decreased serum magnesium and calcium because almost all the transfusion products which we give have mixed acd with them acid citrate dextrose solution with all the blood products phosphorus levels should be maintained above 2.5 to avoid respiratory muscle weakness and altered oxygen hemoglobin dissociation central pontine myel myelinolysis results from marked fluctuations in serum sodium levels which is a very uh, uncommon but can happen on patient regaining consciousness after the post transplant so these all indicate how important the acid uh, the electrolyte and fluid acid base balance is important in a liver transplant patient glucose hem hemostasis is necessary because steroid admission may cause hyperglycemia we all know that once you are on steroid you may land up in diabetes which we have seen number of cases during covid where they were loading the patients with uh, steroid and then coming back after 3 months 6 months with the diabetes cyclosporin and tacrolimus are diabetogenic immunosuppressants and may alter the glucose hemostasis but these two drugs are very important for the patient because our primary aim is to preserve the transplanted organ whereas we closely monitor the other parameters hypoglycemia per se is a complication of liver failure because we all know that liver stores glycogen releases glucose whenever required and in the presence of liver dysfunction glucose administration may be necessary because there are no liver uh, sorry glycogen uh, storage in the transplanted liver and patients with pre op fulminant hepatic failure or necrosis should have lactate levels that trend towards normal after transplantation during or before transplantation in the liver disease lactate is definitely higher than the normal but once the transplantation is done they should the lactate should come down to normal indicating that their fluid status is adequate and elevated lactate levels are also seen in hypoperfusion states during the surgery or later and then sepsis and primary non function of the donor donor liver so this is in short about the electrolyte imbalance and what happens during the surgery and liver is not the main organ for maintaining uh, water acid base balance as i told you initially so there was nothing much i searched lot of literature and this was what i could get so thank you thank you madam for your informative lecture uh my wanted to give this topic electrolytes because electrolytes is a very difficult topic for me so i thought it would be difficult for everyone it is so complicated electrolyte serum electrolyte it looks simple but it is very complicated thank you for the informative session ma'am we will uh, any questions any questions from the audience once the clinicians left the audience interaction has come down <laughs> we'll take a break for lunch uh, uh people wanted i got a message that uh, you people wanted to some people wanted to have a look at the laboratory you can do so in the lunch break okay we will uh, the lunch is arranged outside we'll take a break for lunch
Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you have all settled. Now, shall we move on to our post-lunch sessions? Uh, we are pleased to have Dr. Aparna Madam here. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Aparna Madam, additional professor, Ames B.P. Nagar, uh, to come on to the stage and uh, share her thoughts on lipid abnormalities in liver disease. Please, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. So after the post lunch, I welcome you all. Uh, hope I'll keep you awake and not fall asleep. At the outset, I would, uh, I'm honored, and uh, I, I would like to acknowledge my thanks to Dr. Madhavi and also to the Ashoda management that uh, they have invited me to give the talk. So the lipid abnormalities in liver disorder. When we talk about lipid and liver, they are like synonymous. You feel like most of the liver function is nothing but doing the work, a lot of work on the lipid, if you look at. So these are, uh, the earlier the first thought of my mind went on, okay, it's more on the biochemical basis and we have to learn how the liver is trying to do the job on lipid metabolism. So first I thought maybe I have to deal with the pathways and other things. Then I came to know that asthma is also already taking up the topic of uh, how the liver is actually working uh, with the lipids and uh, she is dealing with the the non-alcoholic and the alcoholic fatty liver. So for me, then, if that particular topic is covered, I would not like to bore you on that same topic. So what is left behind for me was the question I was asking myself, and then we have a lot of other genetic diseases and dyslipidemias, which are also a part of the liver disorder. So in my talk for another half an hour or so, I would like to do that. So I will just very briefly take you to what are the lipoproteins and the, its metabolism and hyperlipoproteinemias and dyslipidemia. How do you do the screening and little bit of the diagnostic modalities. So we all know what are lipoproteins. So as students uh, and some of the students are there. So what are those molecules? What are they? As the word says, it's, it should be a combination of a lipid and a protein. And basically what they are trying to do is they transfer the lipid from the liver to the different organs and back from the organs to the liver. So they are like your transport messengers or the cargo men who are taking it. And what is the liver doing? What is the major problem or major function of the liver is? It is Acquiring the lipids from the diet, what we eat, it is also producing some of the fat within the body, within the liver, and it is packaging it and also sending it across to the other tissues. So basically it is doing lipid acquisition and also it is also disposal of the lipids. So it's a major factory. So the, the major factory where all the lipid Either it is oxidized, either it is synthesized, and if it is synthesized, it is packed up and it is sent to the different tissues. And after their utilization, there is again coming back and it's again recycled and going back. So for this, you need these molecules, which are the transport molecules, the lipoproteins. So they are transport vehicles for the lipids, and they carry the different kinds of components of the lipids to 
various tissues for utilization, and it has both the protein and the lipid component. It has the hydrophobic and hydrophilic part, so all that is cannot be easily in contact with the plasma, goes into the core, and which has the hydrophilic nature, comes outside, and the proteins are also there, where we have different apolipoproteins. It's a kind of a spherical molecule, and it has a structure. So all the ones which are hydrophobic are packed nicely inside, and the ones which are protein antipathic are in the outer layer. So a little bit of this structure. And here it is classified depending on the composition. So these are the transport vehicles. They carry different kinds of things. And that, as they are giving off also, their composition vary. It depends upon, and we have given different names for depending on their classification according to the density. So chylomicron, very low density lipoprotein, intermediate density, low density lipoprotein, and high density lipoprotein depending on their density. And also the composition varies. So the composition we all know depending upon the triglyceride content, cholesterol, cholesterol ester content, we have different names given to them. And they are, can also be classified based on their mobility the, in the electrophoretic pattern. So when they were being classified, when they were separated out, they were given some kind of name. So at the origin, we have the chylomicrons. This is called beta, pre-beta, and alpha. So but the nomenclature is this different to the ones which is being done by the electrophoric pattern, but they are we're referring to the same kind of a molecule. And this is done by the scientist Frederick Singh. And we also have the similar kind of uh, separation happening through centrifugation, where they are separated by means of their density. So these are all the basic uh, features about the chylomicrons. What we know is if you have more of fat, you float. So chylomicrons and VLDL are triglyceride rich. Cholesterol is intermediate. And then if you have AV protein, protein HDL is having less density. OK, this is just for you to remember how the molecules are varying and their density. So what they are doing is they are transporting. But what they are transporting, they're transporting with different substrate of energy molecule. And fat being the energy which is stored in the adipose tissue in the form of triacylglycerol. And they are also transporting the essential components like you need cholesterol and phospholipids to the other tissues, the precursors of various hormones for cholesterol. So the various other uh, hormones which are produced in the other endocrine glands, they need cholesterol. From cholesterol, you get different hormones like steroid hormones, etc. So lipid soluble vitamins and the precursors for bile acids. So that's why the fat is very important. The moment we, we say fat, we think it is bad. No. So body itself also produces fat because of all these reasons. Now we have the help of upper lipoproteins. These proteins, they structurally, they are important component. They help in packing. Not only that, they also help in activating and inhibiting the various enzymes. So what these molecules which are transporting, which help in their functional ability. And they are also recognized on the cell surface and their receptor. They interact with the various tissues. That's why these apolipoproteins are also very important. Now we have various apolipoproteins which have a specific function that APOA1, which is an activator of an enzyme, lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. APO2, inhibitor of hepatic lipase. APO4 is the activator. So likewise, we have APOB100, which is the coming from the liver, the endogenous fat. And B48 is from the intestine. There's a structural variation between the number of amino acids, though it is from the same gene because of the gene editing. And then you have C1, which is an activator of LCAT, C2, the lipoprotein lipase, and C3, inhibitor of lipoprotein lipase. 
Likewise, a lot of these act as an important function. So why do we have to know this is little bit of uh, function and how the working is important before we go into the disorders. So B400 and B48 are coming from the same gene on the chromosome 2. Only with the help of this RNA editing and the stop codon, you will see that they are differently expressed. Liver has all the completely expressed in the intestine. It is stopped because of the stop codon. So you get B48. So why this is important? Because this is the one which goes with the chylomicrons, which is coming from the fat which we take in the diet. And this is the one which is the fat which is produced inside the body endogenously. So we have different pathways for the major lipoproteins, how they are transferred. So when we see, we have the first one is the absorption pathway. That is whatever we eat, it is getting into our body and it is getting absorbed. And here, through the chylomicrons, it goes to the liver with the help of the lipoprotein lipase, which is present in the walls of the blood vessels, and it helps in unloading the and taking the uh, lipids from the intestine to the liver. And next comes your exogenous, uh, the absorption after the absorption, the exogenous pathway through the chylomicrons. Now you have the endogenous pathway where within the liver itself, the uh, free fatty acids which are coming up and also the other fats coming through the diet, there's a pool there which is decided and it will also help in synthesis of different um, fats. So fatty acid synthesis, oxidation, as well as uh, their uh, modified uh, uh, production of different complex lipids, all of them happen. Next, depending on the need, it has to pack it and send it across. When it is packing and sending it, it is sending it through the very low density lipoprotein. And as it is going through the different tissues, it's being utilized and taken up by the tissues. And as there is the density and the composition of the molecule changes, it gives, gets a different name and different apolipoprotein protein happens. So you have LDL, then you have HDL, and you have the two main enzymes which help in the internal transfer of the lipids between these lipoproteins, the lipoprotein lipase, cholesterol ester transfer protein. And this is the cell where the end organs, they take it up. Now you have another part is you can't go on loading it to the end organs. Otherwise, the lipid gets accumulated there. So we have another one which is a reverse cholesterol transport, which is happening through the HDL. That's why commonly this has also been uh, given the name as the good cholesterol. That was on a very brief note. And when we go into the details, we can see that different proteins are important and been assigned and identified as an important marker for their role in their absorption. Like we have this uh, name and pick uh, like one protein which is very useful and very important role it plays in absorption of the cholesterol from the intestine into the intestinal cell. And you also have these fatty acids and fatty acid binding a transporter molecule along with the microsomal uh, triglyceride transport protein where it helps in packing them up again into the chylomicrons with the signature apolipoprotein B48 and from there it goes into the circulation, acquires all other lipoproteins and the LPL that is the lipoprotein lipase with the help of it, it starts giving up the fatty acids to different tissues on the way and its size get reduced. Then later it goes back to the liver through its receptor and undergoes the process. Similarly, the one which is synthesized, the fats which are produced within the liver are packed up in the VLDL and with the marker of B100, it's coming out and through again giving off the different fats 
and after the distribution, it comes back to the receptor and later it is recycled. You have from the tissues, the reverse cholesterol transport, there's uh, molecules like the ABC, that is the ATP ca uh, cascade binding protein, and the PCCK9, they play a very important role in giving the, uh, transferring this cholesterol from the air through the LCAT to the HDL molecules. The HDL has different fractions. First it is discoidal and later it takes up and finally into the liver, which is an important part of the reverse cholesterol transport. So these certain molecules which I have mentioned here is very important. Why? Because when we come to the dyslipidemias, they, these been identified at some genetic mutations at these levels. So when we come to the definition of uh, hyperlipoproteinemias, the one of the definition of dyslipidemia is total cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, triglyceride, or the LPA levels are about the 90th percentile. Means when you take the normal population and you find these values above the 90th percentile, you can tell those people are having dyslipidemia or HDL or upper A1 levels below the 10th percentile of the general population is the definition as per the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey. So this dyslipidemia can result because of intrinsic, extrinsic, or a combination of genetic factors or external factors will lead to this dyslipidemia. So one classification where it says primary dyslipidemias, these are again a heterogeneous group. It has genetic, it has a monogenetic or polygenetic, means a one gene can be involved or number of. And secondary dyslipidemias may result with association with external factors and other pathologies. You also have hypolipidemias. So we'll go with each one of them. And earlier, this dyslipidemias were classified based on the Fredrickson classification. The recent one, which I'm right now projecting is the recent one. Here, it is depending on the pathways. The pathways were the exogenous pathway on the endogenous pathways based on that, the different dyslipidemias are being taken into consideration. So we have just gone through the exogenous pathway. In the exogenous pathway, you will see that the triglycerides are very high, and this is familial uh, lipoprotein lipase, and APO2 deficiency. Here in this, you have both homozygous and heterozygous condition. The homozygous is one in 10 power six, while heterozygous is very common, one in 500 is the prevalence. So these, the phenotypic features, you will see abdominal pain, pancreatitis, xanthoma, lipemia, retinalis. Here, if you look at the different parameters, lipid profile, especially tri, uh, triacylglycerol, the total cholesterol, HDL, and the others, you will see here, it is categorically very high TG, so very high TG, more than 1,000, and also VLDL, because in the VLDL, you will have ma major portion is the triacylglycerol that is being packed. Here, the upper lipoprotein C2, families which have, or have the, there is a deficiency or a genetic mutation, also come into the, they have the similar features and very high TG levels when compared to the cholesterol or HDL. Coming to the next endogenous pathway. In the endogenous pathway here, when we are looking at, we are looking at the VLDL and LDL. Familial hypertriglyceridemia, or familial combined hypertriglyceridemia, and familial hypercholesterolemia. Here, basically, it is the LDL receptors and also the other receptors which are involved in it. As we have just seen in the pathways, all these molecules, APO B100, PSK9, ADA, the, this is an autosomal dominant, the familial hyperdiglyceridemia. The transmission is through autosomal dominance. And it is more commonest form which you see, even in our population. You can see more of them 
suffering from this, which is 1 in 500. And here, the triacylglycerol is high, and it is approximately about 250 to 100 is there. And while other parameters, HDL and normal FOB, might be there, but functional because of the receptor uh, defect, you will find that it is high. The TG is high. Then familial combined hyperlipidemia. In this, homozygous and heterozygous states are there, where again these are approximately about three into five, the common, next common one per thousand. Here you will see here that it is having along with the this lipidemia, you have hypertension, obesity, insulin resistance, vascular stenosis, and cardiovascular diseases, and it is usually in less than 50 years. The heterozygous is again the receptor mutation, and you will see here the xanthomas are common. Here you might see that triacylglycerol might be normal or more, and you will see total cholesterol more, HDL less. Familial cholesterolemia, you have homozygous and heterozygous condition. Here you have the xanthomas, stenosis, cardiovascular diseases, less than 50 years on homozygous in a premature uh, myocardial infarction. The cholesterol TG values are very high. You can also see that here in the FOB is increased and the heterozygous condition, you will see that the, HD, uh, the uh, LDL is about 270 to 550, or it is more than 160. Now we have another uh, classification where both the pathways are involved, the exogenous and the endogenous pathways, where you have this A-beta lipoproteinemia and upper beta lipoproteinemia and familiar this beta lipoproteinemia. So this is mainly with the microsomal triglyceride transfer protein and uh, <laughs> this upper uh, beta lipoproteinemia has autosomal uh, dominance with the transmission. And here you have this, this, lipi uh, this beta lipoproteinemia is the upper B is the one which is having the genetic defect. All of them have mole absorption and uh, this ataxia, pigmentary retinopathy is seen in these conditions. Here you see a combination of thing where there is decreased HDL, you will see the TG is decreased, the cholesterol is decreased, and LDL is decreased, while prothrombin time is increased. Now coming to the next group, exogenous and endogenous pathways, where you have a combination of TG increased and cholesterol increased. This is lipase deficiency, upper uh, lipoprotein B100 deficiency. So so in these conditions, you will see TG is increased and cholesterol is also increased. So here is uh, lipase deficiency. You have seven families and you have these different kinds of mutations happening in these people and they have a familial history of uh, cardiovascular disease and people dying in less than uh, 50 years of age. Above B, 100 homozygous and heterozygous conditions with autosomal dominance. So here it also has this xanthomas, vascular stenosis, and cardiovascular disease. Then PSKC9 is autosomal dominance with, again, coronary premature myocardial infarction is the characteristic feature of these diseases. You have the reverse cholesterol transport in that you have familial apolipoproteinemia uh, and apolipoprotein A1 mutations. Here, you will see there is either autosomal dominance or recessive transmission, and mostly the genetic defect is seen in the upper A1. So there is increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. Why? Because of the very low levels of the HDL and upper A1, which is the stimulator for the LCAT. Now you have certain other diseases which is continued in the, uh, this pathway. You will see Tangier's disease where you have the ABCA1 with the autosomal recessive one, where you have this orange tonsils, splenomegaly, and premature atherosclerosis is seen. You have the LCAT deficiency in this, arcus seminalis, and then the corneal deposits, and 
less than 20 years of age, the total deficiency is there, you see the renal failure. Here you see the TG is increased, the cholesterol is normal, HDL is very low. And you have other exogenous factors where there is another class of set which is known as polygenic hypercholesterolemia, where you have different kinds of genes involved, not only one, one or two mutations involved in it which leads to this particular kind of phenotypic manifestation. So what we have learned earlier with the Fedrickson classification type 1A, 1B uh, was there, but here since the patterns are differing and the combination of which is seen, so this classification is very apt for us to follow the strategies for diagnosing the dyslipidemia. So when we come across the whole of these pathways, then we will understand that all these pathways, wherever there is this defect, what I have just shown you in the table form, you can appreciate it in the form, with the diagrammatic form. So you have the, if there is any pathway deficiency in the ABC, G5 and 8, you will get another one, which is cystulosteloremia, where because of the plant steroids, the defect absorption is seen. Then you can see that when anything with A1, which will have low HDL and <coughs> mutation at this particular point. So you have APOE mutations, you will see that it is type 2 hyperlipidemia. Then if you have a combination of uh, these uh, in the peripheral tissue, the ABCA1 transporter tangious disease and the CD36, uh, you have the metabolic syndrome, you have APOE, you have the familial uh, hypercholesterolemia. And if you have the elevated HDL uh, metabolic syndrome, you will see this, the cholesterol ester transfer protein and lipoprotein lipase, which are there with there whenever they are polygenic. When you have the uh, very short, short ones like defective uh, B100 or its receptor will have a familial defective hyperlipoproteinemia. So different combinations of lipids can happen because the transport is very varied and that's why you cannot pinpoint to one disease. If you have to pinpoint, you have to have the holistic idea of all these parameters into consideration. And after knowing the lipid uh, profile, you can further work on the areas of the disorders. So this is the table which I don't want to bore you again. Um, this is the Fedrickson classification one, where earlier it was given the nomenclature of type 1, type 2, and uh, the familial uh, Likewise, all these numbers were given based on the Fedrickson classification, which we have uh, come across or we have seen in our textbooks. So the earlier one which I just showed you was based on the clinical picture of whether in which pathway it was involved. We have this upper lipoproteinemias also, which we have just seen in the uh, earlier classification. Now coming to single gene diseases, again can also be combined with the same uh, dyslipidemias into hypertriglyceridemia, combined dyslipidemia, hypercholesterolemia. So the same disorders can be again grouped into a different classification based on only if a single gene is being involved. Now, we also have another classification of dyslipidemias by the WHO based on the ONIM numbers. So these are the numbers and the categories. So where the gene mapping has been done and at a particular uh, variation allele, which mutation has been taking place based on that, the classification of dyslipidemias are also present. And here you can also see the content uh, the, what is the type of the particle and how the triglycerides and the cholesterol are varying in these different conditions. So you can cross-check and uh, for diagnosis and treatment, you can go with the first classification. But when you want to do the genetic analysis and find out exactly the cause of which gene and mutation 
you can take this classification and find out uh, which synonym or which allele or what type of dominance and uh, how, uh, whether anything has been previously reported or it's a new one, you can look up to this classification. Um, since familial hypercholesterolemia is very common, I thought I will uh, I focus a little bit more on the familial hypercholesterolemia. Here it is basically because of the LDL receptor defect. It can be co-dominant or complex with multiple genes. It can be heterozygous, homozygous. Heterozygous is very, very common and which we see in mostly in our country too. So here you will see that uh, tendon xanthomas, arcus and, uh, the arcus cornea, premature uh, coronary artery disease, and it's responsible for 5% of MI in people less than 60 years, okay? And here in the homozygous, it is little uncommon, but still it's, you can see in our country, a lot of people suffering from this, and especially if you have premature coronary artery disease before the age of 18, then you should be looking for this. Why we need to know even the uh, status of the gene is because of the treatment. See, drugs, lipid-lowering drugs can be used or LDL FRSs for homozygous and heterozygous with severe disease, liver transplantation can be considered. So this familial hypercholesterolemia has this LDL receptor uh, mutation. So this LDL receptor for the LDL to come out first that the, the protein is synthesized in the uh, endoplasmic retinaculum and it is packed up and then the receptor comes out uh, the endosome, so binding, clustering, and then again coating, and through a uh, release of these is very important. So when there is a mutation, this classification of LDL is further classified into five classes, depending on the where the mutation is there. So synthesis, if it is there in the first part of the transport, binding, clustering, or recycling, the classification of the LDL receptors varies. So the familial hypercholesterolemia still can have the subtypes. So you have the LDL receptor, which is a dominant one with loss of function. The same thing with the ligand, and also with the ligand with the clathrin coat and internalization. And also if there can be a down regulation of serine endopeptidase pro protein convertase. So this pro protein convertase is the one which we were talking even in the reverse cholesterol transport. So this PCSK9 plays a very important role. And how some of the things are same. So this is a picture of plantar xanthoma in the anticubital fossa, which mostly commonly seen in homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And there's the sub or uh, periostal xanthomata. And you have this xanthoma on the Achilles tendon in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. These are ten tendon xanthomas on the dorsum of the hand. And yeah, you can see the bilateral xanthalcimer because of the cholesterol which are getting deposits. This is eruptive xanthomas, which is seen in very severe hypertriglyceridemia. Now coming to the secondary dyslipidemias. So these were all having some kind of genetic defect. When you come to the secondary one, it can be because of some exogenous factor, which is changing the lipid metabolism. They might have little bit of genetic predisposition. So in this, you have hypercholesterolemia, where you will commonly see in hypothyroidism, nephrotic syndrome, cholestasis, anorexia nervosa, and certain drugs like progesterone, thiazide diuretics, carbamazepine, cyclosporine. They are all changing there is some change in the lipid metabolism because of these diseases, there is hypercholesterolemia. And then you have hypertriglyceridemia also happening because of other set of disorders. Not because they have the genetic disease, but it might probe uh, a combination of polygenic factors or this external factor. So obesity, type two diabetes, alcohol consumption, kidney failure, your sepsis, stress, Cushing syndrome, pregnancy, hepatitis, viral infections, most commonly HIV, and drugs like protease inhibitors, steroids, 
beta blockers, estrogen, and thiazide diuretics. And you also have low HDL because of other factors like smoking, physical inactivity, obesity, type 2 diabetes, malnutrition, steroids, and beta blockers. So these are the external factors which might be there apart from having genetic disease which can lead to lipid abnormalities. And you can also have a coexistence of dyslipidemias with this secondary dyslipidemia. Like hypoparathyroidism, the, they might also have the type 2 and 4 insulin dependent nephrotic syndrome. So the coexistence of different types of dyslipidemias can also be seen from, with these external factors. Now we have understood most of the uh, causes of dyslipidemia. And this is an algorithm which is trying to show how we should go about in the lab. So if you have a universal screening uh, and directed with the risk factors too, so you have to take care of all the risk factors, take the family history, take the algorithm of and the history of uh, whether someone has died of uh, premature cardiovascular disease, stroke, uh, what was the age, and how many members of first degree relatives, second degree relatives, if there happens to be more, then the risk is more. And usually you take a fasting or the postprandial um, blood for the analysis and you analyze the total cholesterol, HDL, TG. And you can also go for LPA. LPA only if you uh, have the very strong history of familial hypercholesterolemia, a stroke is there, or a premature cardiovascular disease is reported in the first or second degree relatives. So then the LPA has to be taken into consideration. Then depending on the value, if there is less than 35%, uh, less than 75% is the percentile or the uh, value of the, these parameters, lipid parameters, then it is normal. If it is between 75 to 95, it is borderline. If it is more than 95, it is high. Here you can repeat according to the age and the risk factors and lifestyle changes can be advocated and if borderline you can repeat after 12 months. If it is very high, to confirm it you have to repeat the fasting in 12 hours in different timings and after the interval of two to three weeks, then confirm it. When it is borderline or if it is proved to be dyslipidemia again, then it has to be sent to the medical specialty person to deal with this. In the second phase, you can look up for the secondary causes. When you're looking for the secondary causes, apart from the lipid profile, APO lipoprotein A1, B, C2, and C3 can be estimated to look at the functionality of the different uh, HDL, LDL, and VLDL. And transaminases, albumin, blood glucose, renal function, thyroid function, scan, and beta HCG. All of these would rule out most of the causes of secondary uh, causes which we are listed here, exogenous causes like your obesity, drug, and uh, other uh, treatments, then endocrine problem, when you are having any kind of endocrine disorders, hypo, hypothyroidism, diabetes, pregnancy, etc., kidney diseases, then infectious bacterial or viral diseases, immunocompromised states, liver, liver diseases, Apart from that, where any cholestasis are there, autoimmune and metabolic and others. So here, basically when you look at the lipid disorders, uh, lipid profile, and also rule out the secondary causes of dyslipidemia. And you can also look for the familial and individual risk factors. All these familials are with the history of the previous dyslipidemias and individual risk factors are whether they had uh, diabetes or the other diseases, transplantation, then post-stem uh, transplantation. So all of these would have a risk factor, which is very high risk. Or if it is a moderate risk, obesity, hypertension, and then uh, uh, chronic renal disease, then post uh, any radiation, th this comes under moderate risk. 
then you have might also have an increased risk where they have the premature card uh, known dyslipidemia, obesity, cardiomyopathy, surgical repair, chemotherapy, etc. So all these are the scoring for finding out how effectively or how um, intensively you want and to treat those patients. And you can also adapt for a universal screening uh, policy, population screening at a specific age, or selective to selective population only at risk, or cascade where the screening from an index case that is the parent to the family members including the children, or you can do a reverse cascade screening, screening from the index case of the child to other family members or child to parent and screen at the specific ages to find out if there are any dyslipidemias running in the family. And as we all know, mostly for the coronary artery disease, these are the optimal risk factors as per the National NTCP Adult Treatment Panel 3. Now coming to the next part is how and what, what are the different methods of estimation. Most of us in our labs, we do these enzymatic methods and earlier manual methods for precipitation used to be done outside and then later two-step methods. But nowadays, on the automation, these are all taken care by with the help of the enzymatic methods. Then you have then ultra-centrifugation methods, electrophoretic methods, agarose gel or gradient gel, electrophoresis, and nuclear magnetic resonance imaging is a newer one. There is, apart from the routine enzymatic test, I would like to emphasize on this one particular test which will be very helpful in uh, doing and uh, coming into one conclusion. That is known as standing plasma test. All you have to do is take the plasma and place it uh, in a test tube and make it stand in the fridge overnight at four degrees undisturbed. And next day morning, you can see the sample and come to one conclusion. So plasma sample that remains turbid after the overnight means it contains a lot of excessive VLDL. And if there is a floating cream, it means it is chylomicrons are present. So even before analysis, this is one of the key point. Now what happens, you can see here, this is how the normal one look like. And if there is a chylomicron, you can have a creamy one. And then here, your LDL, VLDL. So these are all the various lipemic samples and a combination if you have VLDL, LDL. Here you can see both the creamy layer as well as the, the turbid one. So that's why it has both of them. So this simple test will guide you for further process of the samples and classify and get the um, picture of dyslipidemias. So the same picture and its interpretation here. So you, after the refrigeration or standing test, if you get a positive or clear, it is normal. And even in the gel electrophoresis, you will get a normal one. Uh, if it is a negative and clear plasma in the 2A, you will see you get an increased beta band. Negative and cloudy, increased beta and pre beta band. And occasionally cloudy, you will get an increased pre beta band. Cloudy, alpha 2. And so these are uh, some of the easy steps for you to before going into the further analysis. If you go for the lipid electrophoresis, you would see that there is a very clear cut demarcation depending on your resolution of your gel, uh, the type of the these bands and the beta. You can see here the chylomicrons are there in the type one, type two beta is increased, two beta is you can beta and pre beta. And then you can see here, beta and pre beta is increased in between the broad band and type four. Here in the pre beta, sharp band is there, and in the type five. Likewise, the electrophoretic gel and 2D and 3D helps in categorizing and differentiating the different types of dyslipidemias. And APOA estimation is also very important, as, as I've just told you about the people having the fa familial history. So it is most heterogenic lipoprotein containing APOA and B, 
and 20 to 30 percent of uh, people are having uh, very high CV risk. And it is also seen in the whites and Asians along with the black people. It's similar to the structure is similar to the plasmalogen, but it interferes with thrombolysis and it binds to the macrophages why the high affinity and promotes the foam cell formation, hence the deposition of the cholesterol in the plaques. That's why it leads to a premature cardiovascular disease. So it's highly genetic and it's resistance to the diet. So drug therapy is usually needed. Another important test which is coming up, just cholesterol, knowing the value of uh, uh, the HDL, VLDL cholesterol is not yet, but you need to know even the function if you want to rule out the secondary causes or also to categorize a particle. So it's based on the basic one principle is while the lipid is being transported uh, by the lipoproteins, you have two things happening. That is the exchange of cholesterol, cholesterol ester through the cholesterol ester transfer protein and by the lipase D, by the TG. So depending on how much of the cargo is being transported among the different lipoproteins, the different molecules have different size and shape and density and the composition varies. So now we want to know more about it rather than just knowing the total cholesterol. So here, if you see the hypercholesterolemia, normal TG, and here normal TG and here hyper TG. But then you can see here the size. Here, they are very large cholesterol-rich LDL particles. Here normal cholesterol and normal TG, this is the normal size of particle. So the size, particle number, and the cholesterol content matters a lot now. So if it is increasing, it's increasing in size. And you can here, you can see there is a small dense LDL which is having like denser and co cholesterol poor LDL particle. And this small dense LDL is the one which is actually more atherogenic. So it's not just having the LDL reporting, but also to know uh, what is the function of the HDL or the LDL matters now. So for this, there is also another test which is known as vertical uh, order profile test, which is known as a VAP test, where they are doing a single test for measuring the lipoprotein cholesterol composition profiling, and it's an ultra centrifugation method, and you get a density gradient spin, and you get the report, and you can report all the contents and also the subclasses. So here you get the HDL subclasses, VLDL, and LDL subclasses in this report. And this is how the report looks like. And you get the actual value, desirable values, and also gives the uh, estimation of the risk along with the other parameters. So more information about the lipid molecule is given through this test. There is also something known as NMR spectroscopy. This NMR spectroscopy, apart from the VAP, gives more number of subunits of the uh, lipoprotein subclasses. So here, depending on the frequency. So it catches up the unit frequency and the signal, and it is read. The LDL, you have so many types and HDL. So likewise, the recorded signal and these subtypes are there. They are all computer analyzed, and the signals uh, gives the concentration of that particular uh, analyte which we have put up. But this is on the only in the experimental and the research mode uh, because it's not completely yet been validated to get the values because too many uh, kinds of waves and uh, things to be recorded. So it's not yet validated. It's still in the experiment mode uh, about the NMR spectroscopy. While lipidomics also would give a similar kind of information, but still it's on the research mode. So likewise, the segmented gradient electrophoresis is enough for us to give the different types of particles. The NMR gives more variance, so you have uh, HDL, LDL, so many particles, VLDL, and the VAP also gives quite a number of uh, information for the lipid. 
So these are uh, now coming to the last one, which is about the drugs, uh, last slide. So I'll just quickly go through it because, um, so you have certain drugs which inhibit at the absorption level itself, where you have the, which is acting on this, uh, the NPC1, L1, so the cholesterol absorption would be inhibited here. And then when we are targeting anything on the N, APOB and the N MTP, that is the microsomal transport proteins, wherever the triglycerides are high, then you use this. These resins are the one which only uh, combine and keep them within the intestine and then throw them out from the intestine, um, not allowing them to be absorbed. Anything which is absorbed, again, getting here, which is endogenously, more of it is produced or there is an endogenous pathway, genetic defect, or anything is being, uh, you have come across, then you can use the APOB inhibitors or the MTP inhibitors in the liver. The, uh, the niacin and phenofibrates, uh, usually, if we are targeting the endogenous, again, this is synthesis uh, of the VLDL and its transportation to different cells. Then cholesterol ester transfer proteins, which are mostly for the HDL, anything to increase the HDL. Then the phen uh, fibrates are the one where the, it is acting on the macrophage and the cellular efflux pathways. So the, uh, this is a table which uh, shows you about the major indications and the dosages of the different HMG CoA reductase, which are nothing but the statins, which block the uh, rate limiting step in the cholesterol synthesis. Then you have the absorption inhibitors and you have the common side effect. You have the bile acid sequestrants and you have the other uh, MTP inhibitors you have the APOB inhibitor, nicotinic acid. So most of them, they also come up with certain kinds of side effects where that's why you will not be able to use it. And most of them also have this dyspepsia uh, or myopathies as their uh, side effect, which leads to the usage being not, or the compliance is little less with the patients. So depending on the type of uh, uh, the mechanism and the type of dyslipidemia you are trying to treat, you have different kinds of drugs available. With this, thank you. So earlier, we are were very agile and uh, nice because we were like hunters and then physical activity was more. Now we are no more, there's plenty of food and less activity. That's why we have become, we are becoming like this. And then not only we are becoming like this, we are making our next generation like us more in advance. That's why the fatty liver and the NASH is more predominant and it's becoming the problem of the present generation and future generation if it is not intervened properly. With this note, thank you. One more thing is uh, we just had done a quick kind of a, um, analysis of all the lipid profiles which we have done in our area, in our um, institute, and we found that the type 1 and the type 2A, that is familial uh, hypercholesterolemia, was about 12.8, and uh, familial combined hypertriglyceridemia was 21 percentage, and you can also see hypertriglyceridemia to the secondary causes was 22.4 in the recent, uh, just we finished this uh, the analysis last month. So we have just uh, submitted this and got a second prize for the poster in the uh, International Conference of the Lifestyle Modifications. With this, thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, it, it was indeed a very informative session. Uh, now uh, we will move on to our next session on urinary biomarkers and liver disease.
for this, I would request Dr. Madhavi Madhan, Senior Consultant Biochemist, Yashoda Hospital, Secunderabad, to come on to the stage and instruct us on urinary biomarkers in liver disease. Good afternoon, everybody. My session is on urinary biomarkers in liver disease. Actually, it should be urinary biomarkers for differentiating acute kin kidney injury in liver disease. So acute kidney injury is one of the most common and morbid complication of decompensated, decompensated cirrhosis. There are uh, three types of uh, AKI, that is pre-renal, hepatorenal syndrome, and acute tubular necrosis. In the clinical setting, the diagnosis of AK AKI, there are pre-established criteria based upon the serum creatinine and uh, rifle guidelines. They uh, diagnose AKI, but importance of biomarkers lies in differentiating between the three different types as I mentioned earlier. The differentiation is necessary because the th therapy is also different for different conditions. Pre-renal AKI is generally reversible with volume resuscitation and discontinuation of diuretics. Hepatorenal syndrome is managed with vasoconstriction and volume expansion. And acute tubular necrosis often warrants a fluid restrictive and supportive therapy. But differentiating based on only on serum creatinine is difficult. And uh, the, this led to the uh, study of novel kidney markers for differentiation between these three conditions. However, when we see clinically, they are not distinctly differentiated. It is actually a spectrum like uh, of the three conditions. Kidney markers can be categorized as markers of kidney dysfunction, tubular injury markers, and cell cycle arrest markers. Tubular injury markers increase with cellular damage, it is uh, which is characterized by alteration in cell metabolism and expression of adhesion molecules. And cell cycle arrest markers, they detect cellular stress, which is potentially reversible and may or may not uh, develop into cellular damage. This figure gives a brief outline of the markers which I am going to talk about. I am going to co concentrate mainly on urinary biomarkers. Tubular injury markers have got special focus because they are they uh, uh, they have their levels have been observed to be different in all the three conditions, with the lowest level being in uh, pre-renal azotemia and highest in acute tubular necrosis. The potential tubular markers which I am going to talk about is NGAL. All of you must have heard about NGAL. It is neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin and N-acetyl beta-D glucose aminidase, which I would be referring as NAG, and interleukin-18, kidney injury molecule 1, which I would be referring further as KIM-1, and liver type fatty acid binding protein, that is LFABP. Coming to NGAL, NGAL is the most studied parameter in, uh, in this uh, biomarker, most studied biomarker of all these. It is a 25 kilo Dalton protein, and it belongs to the lipocalin family and it is produced by thick ascending and collecting ductal cells of the kidney, and but it is also produced by cells of liver, lung, and gastrointestinal tract. It was initially recognized in the supernatant of neutrophilic cells. It is a binding partner with matrix metalloproteinase 3. It plays, an innate, it plays a role in the innate immune system. It acts by sequestering the iron sidrophore complexes, thus limiting iron uptake for the bacteria. Elevated NGAL uh, levels, they can increase within 3 hours after tubular injury and peak around 6 to 12 hours, depending on the severity of the injury. These NGAL levels were found to be high, even in, uh, in, the, in the lack of diagnostic serum creatinine levels. Serum creatinine levels usually increase only after 50% of the renal damage is seen. Then you, but there are certain confounding conditions for urinary NGAL. It is also increased in inflammatory disease, urinary tract infection, chronic kidney disease, and also during uh, sepsis, liver synthesis of NGAL also increases. Methods of analysis of NGAL, ELISA method is available, and also chemiluminescent microparticle immunoassay method is available. ELISA, though being cheap, uh, it is a cheaper method among the two, but it has its own disadvantages. The dynamic range of ELISA is uh, very, uh, is restricted. And also the turnaround time is more in ELISA and it is also a laborious process. Whereas, uh, whereas CMIA, that is chemiluminescent microparticle immunoassay, it, is, it, it has comparatively a shorter turnaround time. 
and uh, its uh, dynamic range is also more and it is also uh, like it is basically an auto analyzer based method and it is we, it, we can call it as user friendly actually then coming to nag nag originates from lysosomes of proximal tubule so it is increased in proximal tubular injury because the lysosomal integrity is lost and it has a large molecular weight so it is not filtered by the glomerulus so extra renal sources of nag is is ruled out the two advantages of using nag are sensitivity even subtle alterations in the proximal tubule uh, results in shedding of nag which is directly proportional to the damage and the, its quantitation is also simple and it is it can be done by reproducible enzymatic assays you using a spec uh, and we can measure this analyte colorimetrically using a spectrophotometer but uh, it has bond, uh, this even this has his limitations it is inhibited by endogenous urea and it is also inhibited by a number of nephrotoxic substances and also heavy metals and it is also found increased levels are also found in inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and uh, impaired glucose tolerance and also in hyperthyroidism then interleukin 1 interleukin 1 as a, as the name suggests it is a pro inflammatory cytokine it is a inactive precursor and it is uh, synthesized in a variety of tissues such as monocytes macrophages proximal tubules epithelial cells and intercalated duct cells of collecting ducts and it is found intracellularly and it is activated by caspase 1 it is released into the urine after ischemic injury to the proximal tubule and it begins to rise roughly 6 hours after kidney damage and peaks between 12 to 18 hours it is not confounded by urinary infections nephrotoxic aki and chronic, chronic kidney disease however it is increased in response to ischemia of different organs including uh, when including heart and brain apart from kidney and since it is an inflammatory mediator it increases during sepsis joint inflammation inflammatory bowel disease liver inflammation and also lupus then kidney injury molecule 1 kidney injury molecule 1 it is a 37.38.7 kilo dalton protein it is a transmembrane glycoprotein with uh, immunoglobulin and mucin structural domains it has been utilized as a sensitive indicator for renal tubular injury it is highly specific particularly for ischemic or nephrotoxic aki because it is rarely expressed in other organs and it is unaffected by prerenal azotemia urinary tract infections and chronic kidney disease however Ah, another advantage is that it is easily detectable in urine it increases within the first hour of tubular toxicity or ischemic injury much before serum creatinine however uh, it also increases in uh, comorbid conditions such as diabetes hypertension atherosclerosis cerebral ischemia and it is also susceptible to inflammatory diseases coming to liver type fatty acid binding protein as the name suggests it is a free fatty acid transporter it is expressed in proximal tubule it transports free fatty acids from mitochondria or peroxisomes and it can predict the aki or sepsis complicated by aki and its level could be affected by infection or di liver disease so uh, it, it its levels are also increased in ckd suggesting its role as an anti antioxidant and reno protective substance but lfa vp is also increased with certain non diabetic ckd early diabetic nephropathy and polycystic kidney disease idiopathic focal glomerulosclerosis and uh, specificity for kidney disease is is uh, not that uh, acceptable when liver disease is also present then coming to biomarker for cell cycle arrest there are uh, there are two components tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase 2 and insulin like growth factor binding protein 2 these two are combinedly called as nephrocheck and nephrocheck is a biomarker which is uh, approved by the us fda which can be used for uh, detecting aki so the function of timp2 is it inhibits the activity of matrix metalloproteinase and it affects the regulation of cell cycle it inhibiting endo, uh, inhibiting endothelial cell proliferation and angiogenesis and insulin like growth factor bp7 it's a secreted protein and it regulates the bio availability of insulin like growth factors through direct binding so uh, 
it, its role is proposed in NKI because the G1 sen cycle arrest is a known conse consequence of acute kidney injury. As I told you earlier, it is, it is combinedly called as nephrocheck and it is approved by the US FDA. And method of analysis is alpha, that is enzyme-linked fluorescent immunoassay. And uh, it was useful in predicting moderate to severe AKI with, uh, within 12 hours in critically ill patients, but its role in liver disease, like AKI with liver disease, is uh, it, the, it, an unclear role is described in the studies. Then methods to quantitate these biomarkers, as I've told earlier, ELISA is available and CMIA is available for NGAL, ELFA is available for nephrocheck. Apart from this, initially they were uh, based on enzyme-based colorimetric assays using a spectrophotometer. But as the importance of these biomarkers, ga uh, they gained importance. ELISA was developed for many of these biomarkers. But the, uh, the disadvantages of ELISA, as you all know, the, it can detect only one antigen, I mean, at a time. And the dynamic range is also very narrow and, uh, and, and a long turnaround time. Later, based on flow cytometry, a recent technique was developed, that is adaptation of ELISA. And it is a particle-based flow cytometric assay developed by Luminex that uses microfluidic pla platform incorporating microbeads coupled with the primary capture antibody. And uh, every microsphere is labeled with a precise ratio of red and orange emitting fluorochromes, giving it a unique specific signature. Then uh, the quantification is achieved by adding a biotinated secondary antibody and streptobidin coupled with a third fluorochrome. The signal is directly proportional to the amount of antigen bound at the microbead surface. Then proteinuria. So this is the most commonly done test uh, urine biomarker for the diseases. And in health, protein is prevented from entering the tubular fluid by complex glomerular barrier. It is highly effective. However, glomerular disease results in defects in this barrier and it leads to subsequent increase in urinary protein and which has been uh, contrib which contributes to the tubular cell apoptosis and leads to increase in markers such as NGAL and KIM1, which indicate tubular damage. Proteinuria is common in patients with cirrhosis. However, the quantification of proteinuria is important. A urine protein creatinine ratio of more than 30 is both a sensitive and specific marker for predicting hospital acute kidney injury and mortality. Then high incidence of mild proteinuria in patients with cirrhosis requires further investigation. It may represent unrecognized glomerular disease, which is not uncommon in patients with cirrhosis. And hepatic IgA nephropathy is also uh, recognized with alcohol-related uh, liver disease. And hepatitis C is also associated with glomerular nephritis. Microalbuminuria. Microalbuminuria is defined as urine albumin excretion of 30 to 300 mg per 24 hours has been determined to be a significantly more frequent in subjects with non-alcoholic uh, liver disease among type 2 diabetes. And uh, increased prevalence of microalbuminuria is also seen in non-diabetic and non-obese patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And elevated urine albumin creatinine ratio is associated with systemic inflammation. And systemic inflammation is a hallmark of kidney injury in cirrhotic patients. The, mes the summary of the presentation is that there is a clear need for better biomarkers for prediction, early detection, differential diagnosis, treatment guidance, and pro uh, prognosis of AKI in cirrhosis. Urine LGAL is the most studied biomarker, and uh, it, it, it definitely, the levels are different in all, the th in all the three types of AKI. However, the confounding factors have to be taken into account while the interpretation of the test. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I request Dr. Rajkumar, sir, to give away a memento to Dr. Madhavi, ma'am.
I request Dr. Rajkumar sir to please come on to the dais and to say a few words. everyone hope you enjoy enjoyed this academic feast and also show the hospitality so now this uh, concluding time is coming so i uh, take this opportunity to thank you all the delegates for enrolling for this cpd i thanks all the speakers Dr. Nivedita, Dr. Uh, Ashma, Dr. Radhika Madam, Dr. Aparna Madam for taking out uh, time from your busy schedule and sharing your knowledge. Also, I would like to thank uh, our eminent uh, consultants, Dr. Raman Bodula sir and Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor sir for coming and sharing their knowledge in spite of having their busy OPD. So, Actually, laboratory medicine is not a one department like any other department. There are multiple departments within a department, and in that, biochemistry is also one of the biggest department. So, like the in clinical side, there are many subspecialties are coming coming up. So, we have to reciprocate them by giving the better diagnosis for having a multiple subspecialties. So, nowadays, this lab laboratory medicine is no longer a back-end operation. Now it is also become a front-end uh, front operation. So we are having almost, I think, uh, every alternate month one CPD or conference. So going forward also, we are planning many such uh, events, uh, not only in biochemistry, but in other departments as well. So you are most welcome in uh, future CPD also. We are having a four uh, hospitals. So maybe in Ishoda, Sikandrabad, or any other units, one or after another, we may have another CPD program. So all of you are most welcome. And once again, thank you very much for uh, attending this CPD. And uh, I would like to thank my this uh, back-end team. Without their uh, efforts, this show is not successful. So Kiran, I don't know many of the speakers' name. So thank you very much for giving this seamless uh, support. I would like to thank our uh, F&B team, our marketing team, and uh, admin team, and last but not the least, Dr. Anamika and Dr. Madhvi for their tireless efforts since last almost two months to make this uh, more successful. Dr. Arpita and Dr. Uh, Divya from our another units, they also supported very well. And also our local admin lab admin team, where is Krishnevini? Krishnevini, Dr. Krishnevini, then Suvasini, Lalita, they have taken all the efforts. And also the Cardell and Ortho team, OCD team, for sponsoring this CPD. So thank you, Cardell, Ortho. And uh, in future also we'll plan many, <coughs> many more such CPDs. So thank you all. And uh, I'm sorry if I forgot anyone's name. Uh, did I? No, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think lastly now the fun event is pending from the Cordell Artho program, uh, Cordell Artho team. So please let us enjoy this also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, all. Good evening. Yeah. So, from mo since morning, I think uh, you people are very um, like tired with uh, all the sessions. We thought we'll have some small fun session. 
So that's what called uh, Kahoot. And uh, I think all of you have your mobiles, right? With a good network. So if you have your mobiles, so I request you all to go to um, uh, Google and type kahoot.it. So then it will be um, uh, open one uh, application, Kahoot. So there we'll pl pl play a small game. So it is nothing but uh, all, all uh, this is a small quiz of 15 questions. And uh, maybe uh, you may like these questions or you may not like these questions. So you have water bottles with you and uh, so you have iPhones also. <laughs> Those you don't like, you can throw your iPhones on me. So, <laughs> so with this, so we'll start Kahoot. Go to go Google and uh, type Kahoot.it. Kahoot.it. So this is the site uh, where you have to go. This is kahoot.it. And uh, here we'll display one game pin. There you have to um, uh, type your game pin. So that is the game pin 862384. 862384. Then it will ask you for a nickname. You can give you any nickname. And then you will be entering. So maybe a few people may be asking that uh, what, is, uh, what, what, what is for me. So definitely uh, you will have something. And you will have three prizes in this. So. Uh, Three prizes you will get it, first, second, and uh, third prizes for the winners of this Kahoot. And you have 15 questions. Each question will have 30 seconds of time. So within 30 seconds, you need to give the answer. Here, fastest finger will get more points. Each question will have 1,000 points. And uh, maybe uh, all 40 of you may be right, but uh, few may get high many points, and you may get low points. So that's the reason. Be fast, and your network should be very fast. So, 37 people have joined. Another three can join. Any, anybody, anybody not joined till now? Can you raise? Azar. One more, one more can join. Anyone left? Anyone left without joining? Shall we start? If all of you say okay, then I'll start. Otherwise, no, it will, the, the time is very less. Shall we start? Right. Here is your first question. It is going to come. Role of liver is to produce all except what is the what is what is the exception over there? Bile, cholesterol, proteins, gamma globulins. So one is not produced by liver, and maybe. So these are all. These are all from your uh, topics since morning only. Uh, 
So we have got 35 answers, another uh, four are pending. So let's see. So good. 13 people have given the right answer. So that is gamma goblins, so which is not produced by liver. So let's see on the podium who are on the um, uh, first, second, third, and fourth. Uh, great, Sonali, Sam, RK, R, and AB. So these are, the, these are the five which are on the um, uh, podium now. So uh, I think, uh, who is Sonali? Right. Sam? RK? So you have you, you have only ten points difference uh, with uh, with all your other uh, mates. So there is a chance of they they will come up and they will go. You will go down. So that's the reason you be fast with your fingers. And next question: the following will damage the liver except one: alcohol, obesity, type two diabetes, and water. That's the reason I told you, you may not, you may not like also. <laughs> you can throw your iPhone now. <laughs> I don't give. So let's, only one answer I think pending. Now let's see on the podium. 34 has given right answer. Uh, another four is the wrong answer. Oh, now Sonali, Sam, RK, AV, same, same, all, all the five are there on the podium. So I think, uh, let's see. Uh, shall we go to the third question? Is it true or false? Over usage of antibiotics will damage the liver. Is it true or false? One more answer uh, not yet came. Maybe they may, they may lost their network or I don't know. Yeah, 38. Good. So 35 has the right answers. It is true. It will damage the liver. And uh, now on the podium, yes. Sonali, RK, R, and... Uh, Chaitu has come up. Uh, let's see. Next question. What is the normal weight of a human liver? 200 grams, so, so 2,000 grams, 1,000 grams, 1,500 grams, and none. It may not be the answer also there. You can select none also. Thirty people has given right answer. It is fifteen hundred grams. Let's see on the podium now. Oh, RK has come up and Sonali has gone down. Maybe you may be on the sixth or seventh place. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, I think this is the relevant relevant questions right now, right? So let's see next question. Where is the first liver transplantation done in India? <coughs> yeah, yeah, you can, you can. You have only 30 seconds. By the time you lift, it will be over. <laughs> Ma'am, these are all relevant. It is done in Delhi. So actually, it is done in Delhi, Apollo. Uh, patient name is uh, Sanjay. And now he became liver transplant surgeon, Dr. Sanjay now, after 25 years. And it is done in Delhi Apollo. Right? Let's see the podium. Same. There's no change. There's no, there's no change in the uh, podium. Let's see. Next question. Who is 
is current speaker of Lok Sabha. <laughs> Sumitra Mahajan, Om Birla, Jagdeep Dan Dankar, and Adil Rajan Choudhury. You can Google it, sir. <laughs> so, current speaker is Om Birla. Let's see the podium now. So, I think 15 people have given right answer. Good. So, newcomers has come up. So, Nani, Dr. Aradhana, Suri, RKR. Right? So, let's go to the seventh question now. How many people are on the National Liver Transplant Waiting List now, currently? What is the status? 25,000, 14,000, 14,000, 1,400. These are all approximate uh, uh, numbers. Uh, it may not be exact number, but it is an approximate number. It is 14,000 now on the waiting list. So, 10 answers are right answers. Let's see the podium. Oh, JSJ, RI, Aradhana, Dr. K. Good. And uh, shall we go? Eighth question. So we are on the half of the way. So maybe those who have not uh, passed till now, maybe you can be passed so that you can come into the podium, definitely. This is a true or false question. Can we donate a portion of liver to someone in Same, there is no change in the podium currently. And uh, let's go for the ninth question. When was the first adult to child living donor liver transplant performed? This question is not pertaining to India. It is the first time what we are asking. Good. 15 people has given right answer. It is 1989. It is in Australia. They have done it. Let's see the podium. Oh, JSJ, RI, Aradhana, Ami, Dr. Amit, and R. So, so RI has given four correct answers um, uh, till now without fail. Next question. This is the 10th question. Who is Central Health Minister of India? I think it's, it is relevant, right? <laughs> Central Health Minister. Great. 31 people has given right answer. So, Mansu Kel Mandavia. Uh, now, now only uh, Chaitu has come up and uh, RK has gone down. And let's see. So, another five questions, the last five questions. So, uh, you can, uh, it, it can decide the game also uh, for many of you. And let's see, 11th question. Gastroenteritis associated with the severe diarrhea is caused by what? Decreased level of TAC, 
increased level of TAC, there is no effect of TAC on this and none. That means this is related to the subject only. <laughs> it is increased level of tack, so that will cause diarrhea. So let's see the podium. Now JSJ, Dr. Ramit, Chaitu, AJ, and Dr. Aradhana. So maybe uh, you all have only um, 200 points difference between Chaitu and uh, Dr. Amit, and 1,000 points difference uh, between AJ and uh, uh, Amit. So maybe you, you may have to act fast so that uh, you can uh, come into the first position. So Dr. AJ. Uh, let's see, 12th question. How long does tactolemus stay in circulation? Two years, sorry, uh, maybe it's maybe a typo error. Uh, lifelong and uh, six to twelve months. You can consider only two answers. So six to twelve months, as per the literature, it says. So it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, so thirty-two people has given uh, right answer. Right answer. So next one. Let's see the podium. Sami. Sami. And uh, now, so shall we go to the 13th question? This is a true or false question. Obesity is said to be become the leading cause of liver disease by 2030. Is it true or false? I think the recent uh, uh, like presentation also it has shown that. Uh, I think we have got all the answers. Let's skip. 13 are right. Good. Very good. It is going to be the leading cause. And there is no change in the podium, obviously. And uh, 14th question. This is also true or false. Lipid parameters play an important role in liver transplantation. Is it true or false? Good. So currently, so JSJ, Amit, Dr. Amit, Chaitu, Dr. AJ, and uh, Sami, uh, these five are there on the podium. The last question, so which may uh, it may it can lead to the um, many of the changes in the uh, podium. Let's see. So be fast. And it do, th those Sami also can can be the top or topper also in, in with this question. So let's see and be faster. And last question: addition of 1915 and 21. It is an addition. <laughs> 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 let's see. Let's see how many has given right answer. It is 55. So let's see the winners. So shall we? <laughs> Dr. AJ is on the third position. Dr. JSJ on the second position. And the winner today, the winner of the is Dr. Amit. Congratulations to all the winners. So I request uh, Dr. Madhavi ma'am and um, to uh, give the prizes to the winners. So I'm announcing uh, third winner of this uh, of today's Kahoot is Dr. AJ. Can you come forward, please?
congratulations ma'am and uh, second winner is the jsj congratulations ma'am finally the winner of kahoot today is so dr amit Congratulations, sir. So, thank you so much for all your uh, patient um, attending this um, session. So, I hope all you enjoyed. Thank you so much. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed all the sessions from morning, not only this fun filled session. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interactive and educative. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere vote of thanks to Dr. Lingaya sir, our medical director, our Dr. Rajkumar sir, Dr. Gopi Krishna sir, Dr. Uh, Raman Budula sir, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor sir, and also other eminent speakers, Dr. Anamika, Dr. Aparna, Dr. Asma, Dr. Radhika Chaudhary, and, uh, and also our distinguished audience. Uh, and I would also extend my vote of thanks to our marketing team, to our branding team, to our FNB team, to our digital marketing team, and also our housekeeping staff, which, uh, as Sir said, they, without their support, it would not have been possible. I thank you all, and I hope we will meet again for another uh, CPD on biochemistry, and I'll see a more interactive audience this time. Thank you. I request Dr. Arpita and Dr. Sri Divya. I have to felicitate them. Please come on to the dais. <laughs>